Hey folks, welcome back. I'm just Shannon Levin, your friendly librarian, and I'm back with some book love, so let's chat. I've got a nice stack for us going on again today. From my last video, I think I learned that you don't care how long the videos are because it was my longest video and my best performing, um, and I just talked all day about books. I don't have all day to chat about books today, unfortunately. I'm hosting a craft group here tomorrow, so I have been cleaning like a fiend for the last month. Um, there is nothing like hosting a party at your house to get your house all sparkly clean and do all those things that you just never do, like clean your baseboards. <laughs> but I really wanted to sit down and talk to you about some books before I got started on the final cleaning and preparation today, because really all I gotta do is cook some today. Um, and I have some five-star reads again. I know, it's insane. I have had a great reading year. Um, lots of five stars. In my last video, I named some five stars that I've done this year. Uh, and I'm gonna add some to the stack today. Some that made me want to sit down and make the video the second I finish the book because it's so good. And I want everyone to enjoy this read. But before we get started on that today, um, I've got a couple of things to talk to you about, but I'll show you the stacks before I move them off the table. These are some of the books that I wanna talk to you about that I own and I've read since the last time we've talked. I have some book haul books. I have some more book haul books. I've done a lot of book shopping and I don't know why because I have plenty, but it's summertime. I'm a teacher. I have the summer off. Let me loose. I'm going to find a thrift store, a bookstore. I'm going to buy some books to add to my collection. Um, I also will insert some before and after pictures, or I'm going to try to anyway. This is not the best thing that I do, uh, but I uh, did rearrange all my shelves. That took me about two days um, during the last uh, month of trying to prepare for my get together for tomorrow. Um, I took books um, off the shelf, cleaned the shelves, and then rearranged quite a bit. And I did it all with you in mind because I do wanna make some videos um, that are not just, hey, here's what I've read since the last time we've talked, here's our book talk, here's our book news. I wanna make some videos about some of my favorite collections like my Agatha Christie collection. And you know that I'm doing that Facebook group where we're talking about them. And I just, I can't explain to you how wonderful that project has been. I'm so glad that I started that and that I've gotten like a nice core group of people that are reading those with me. But I wanna to talk to you about Agatha Christie. I also wanna to talk to you about Lillian Jackson Braun. It's one of my favorite cozy series. And I've read most of those, if not all of those before I ever started this video. So I know I really haven't talked to you a lot about her. I wanna to talk to you about a lot of those cozies that are up there. I have some award winners. I have some books, um, books of the month. I'm not a subscribing member. I buy them secondhand, um, but I have some of those that I want to talk to you about. Um, I have a holiday section that I want to talk to you about. Um, there's a lot that I want to talk to you about. So I hope that you are getting some recommendations out of these videos or that I'm talking about a book that you're like, hey, yeah, I read that one too. And that we can think about those books together because to me, reading, although I do most of my reading alone, um, is more of a communal experience when I get to talk to you about the books and I, or I get to recommend the book to you to see which ones that I can connect you with because that's what I'm trying to do is make sure that I share the love of reading with you. All right, it's early morning here. By early, I mean eight-ish o'clock, I think. Um, and in my community, we had a tornado um, about a week and a half ago. And so uh, we did not have any property damage. We had a lot of debris through the yard, but we didn't have any property damage. But across the street, there was a tree that fell over into our yard, across the road and into our yard. And they are removing that today. So it might be a little noisy at times because of course I have the door cracked open. Um, I did make an ASMR video for you uh, and release that one right before this one. Um, of just reading on the porch for the entire day. Uh, I actually filmed that maybe even last summer. I feel like it was a long time ago or in the spring maybe, um, but I was just now getting it put together and out there for you. But I live in a wonderful place. It is paradise. We live on a lake. I'm not on the lake. I'm across from the lake, um, but I can see the lake. Um, but all of the sounds out here are just amazing background chatter for reading. I absolutely love it. So you may hear some of that today too, but I will close the door if it gets a little too noisy. 
So some of our beginning things that I always start with, yes, it is eight o'clock in the morning. I am not drinking coffee because I have to go to the grocery. And so I will be picking up a little Starbucks. Uh, so I don't want to get too much coffee in my system today. So I'm reading, I like this, um, it's Reduce. I think I picked it up at Kroger if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it has, I am officially a book wizard, not a bookworm decal on it. Don't you love these decals? Like they are, I, I don't know if you are one of those people, but I'm a child of the 80s and I collected stickers. I still have a sticker book around here somewhere. Uh, so this whole new thing that I feel like everywhere you go, every coffee shop, every store, every festival has a little decal either either giving away or selling. I'm a sucker for it. Especially if it has anything to do with books. <laughs> but I'm just drinking some cucumber water this morning um, because I am really looking forward to that coffee. I also have a little, what do you call that? <laughs> what do you call that? A, uh, not a placemat, um, coaster. Huh. I have a little coaster. I've always imagined that Paradise will be a kind of library by Jorge Luis, no, Jorge Luis Borges. That's how we're gonna say that name. But that is a super cute quote. So we're using that today. I'm sure I got it as a gift from someone. Thank you if you're watching, whoever you are. And I know you can't smell it through the interwebs, but uh, this was my perfume today and I thought, oh, I need to show them that too. I like to show you anything that's book related because if you are a book lover, and let's be honest, why would you be watching this video if you are not, then uh, you are probably like me and it's like anything book related, you're like, oh, that's cute. Oh, that's cute. Oh, that's cute. Um, so this, um, I think I ordered it online. It's Demeter. Sometimes you can find this at TJ Maxx or Marshall's, but, um, you can't be picky about the scent when you find it. Uh, I think that's how I got hooked on it. And then it was like, they have all these weird, weird scents like, um, cut grass or I don't know, whatever. My other one is sea salt. I know that. Uh, but this one is paperback and it just has a really cool, let's see if it says, hmm. It does not tell me what the notes are, unfortunately. I don't even know how I would describe it to you. I love it, that's all I know. I love it, when it runs out, I will order more. Oh, the other thing that I do know about that, like I said, it's called Demeter Fragrance Library. Maybe that's again, another reason why I picked it up. But um, another thing that I would tell you about the company is when I went online to order um, some of it, and I think I had heard this existed, so that's why I went on to, to order this one. But um, you could get like a sampler pack, and I can't remember how much it was, but you know, I'm not cheap, but I'm also not like extravagant either, so <laughs> I'm somewhere in the middle there. Uh, but I ordered this like uh, sampler pack that had, um, I don't know, like maybe 10 or 15 different scents that they have, and these little tester tubes, and that was really cool. I really had a good time with that because, again, they were just like weird scents that you're like, I don't know if I really want to smell like that. Like, I like the smell, but I don't know that I want to smell like a paperback book. I do. <laughs> so just recommending that to you. I always like to throw out some of those recommendations for you. All right. So first order of business. Um, I got book tagged, video tagged. I'm not really sure. Like I am, I know that I've been doing this for now about two years, but <laughs> I still am not real super fluent in the whole YouTube booktuber con um, conversation, <laughs> but, um, I got tagged. It's called the small booktuber tag. I was tagged by Jane at the reading nook. I will definitely link her. And so I want to respond to that tag. Jane is even newer to booktube than I am. And I know that we um, met <laughs> um, through the Beach Bum Book Worms Discord site. Uh, and you know I've talked to, to you about them before. They do the Killing Time with Cozies on Saturday. It's just kind of a book chat um, and reading sprint kind of video that I sometimes drop in on. I really enjoy it because it's something that makes me like sit down and read for a time. Uh, so when I have an afternoon that I can do that or an evening, they do them throughout the week sometimes too. Um, I like to do that and you can chat while you're doing that. And that's where Jane and I have met um, online. Jane and I are both self-proclaimed book addicts. We seem to read a lot of the same kinds of literature. I know she's also an Agatha Christie fan. So thank you, Jane, for tagging me. And here are some answers to those questions. Uh, I'm DeShannon. I am your friendly librarian because I was a school librarian for 20 years uh, and then my school eliminated that position. So now I am back into the classroom teaching English, which I've talked to you about before. I'm not thrilled about it, but I do really enjoy it a lot more than I thought I would, but I really, really miss my library. So that's how this kind of came about. 
So I think I'm on like question number four. What, do I, what is it that I love about BookTube? Um, I love that it allowed me a channel, huh, pun intended, to share my love of reading. Uh, when I lost that, when I lost my school library, it was extremely traumatic. <laughs> and even though I am in the English classroom and I still recommend a book a day and I get to talk about books and I'm still immersed in that life, it is very different than whenever I was in the library um, and that was my main job. Like I loved it. I felt like it was my purpose in life was to help connect people with the right kinds of books. It was a type of therapy. It gave me a channel to talk to people and I just absolutely loved it. So because that no longer existed um, and this kind, it, it did overlap. Did it though? I started the channel at the very beginning of the pandemic. They closed my library during the pandemic and then I kept doing the channel and then it morphed into a personal YouTube, booktube, book chat channel. <laughs> so it kind of morphed into this. What I really love about booktube is not only that I get to share all of these with, um, with you, with everybody who wants to tune in. If you want to hear about books, I'm your girl. <laughs> if you want book reviews, it's me. You want to hear somebody chat at, um, <laughs> ad nauseum about books, I'm it. And then through that, I've also watched a lot of booktubes, connected with people. I've started doing those um, reading sprints, being a part of that. And it just all kind of goes together so that it doesn't get lost in all of the things that I have to do, like clean my baseboards. It just doesn't get lost. I'm able to take some time to focus on something that is a huge part of my life that I really enjoy. I get a lot of enjoyment out of it and I want other people to enjoy it too. Number five is what types of books do you read? Um, if you are a um, regular watcher of my videos, you know I read all kinds, like all kinds. <laughs> um, I love mysteries, I love thrillers, I love classics, I love Agatha Christie, I love YA literature, I love award winners, um, I love all kinds. I love nonfiction, I love short stories, I love essays, all kinds. Um, in the last, I would say, five years or so, I've really started trying to read more modern um, books, like as they're coming out, um, and I've gotten pretty good about doing that. You know, again, I'm thrifty. I don't want to pay full price for a book, and usually that was the roadblock of why I was not reading books that like when they were immediately released. But I've becoming, I've, I've become very fluent um, at using my public libraries online platform Libby to get ebooks and read them that way or audiobooks and listen to them that way and with doing that I can get books when they first come out like I've got several cards at several different libraries under different platforms um, and it's easier to do that so I have really started focusing more on that the last question is what is your favorite video and I would say my favorite video is always my last video <laughs> I don't know why um, because I don't know that I would say that I get better at this but I think I do get more comfortable with it. And it's like, um, it has kind of driven me that when I'm reading or when I'm out and about, I think, ooh, I'm gonna put that on the table and start making the piles. Like that's something I really wanna share with people, which is why I make these videos. I really wanna share. I want to share the love of reading and the enjoyment and the stress relief and just the entertainment that comes out of find something that feeds into your life and remember to make time for that. That's what I'm doing. And then this last part, I felt like I'm not really prepared for, but you need to tag four small booktubers. Um, so I might have to put a little bit of thought in there, but if I'm doing it off the top of my head, obviously I would tag Jane from the book nook. She's the one who tagged me and I have been watching her videos. Uh, our shared love of Agatha Christie definitely is why I'm drawn to her channel. Um, I almost always watch Storm Reads. She's another one that is in the Killing Time with Cozy's uh, group that she's often um, one of the moderators, I think is what you call it. So um, yeah, I really like her videos. She does a lot of wrap ups. Again, we seem to like a lot of the same kinds of books. Uh, Dark Roots Creations, I think is what it's called. Um, I watch a lot of hers. Um, I don't know, you just, you have to find someone that like when you're watching the videos or you're listening to the videos, they sound like a friend. And um, I think that's what draws me to these booktubes. I don't know what really classifies as small booktuber, but I'll put those three in there. Um, and then I found most of these through the Beach Bum book 
um, Killing Time with Cozy's group. So I will tag them too. Although I don't know that I would consider her small because she does a lot of um, interviews with authors on her channel. So that's probably not small. I'll think about that. I'll see if I can revise it next time, do a little bit better job. So anywho, that's who I am as a booktuber. Um, if you've been listening to my videos, I think you kind of have caught on to that. I talk about a lot of those things, um, the pandemic, starting during the pandemic, losing the library, teaching English. I talk about them all the time because it is part of my life. Uh, but that's a little bit of an interesting, or that's a little bit, um, that's a little bit of information from the small booktubers book tag. Thank you, Jane, once again for tagging me. In the end, I just like to create beautiful spaces in person, online, here in this community. I am just trying to create a beautiful space for us to get together and talk about books. So that takes us to the books that I've currently been reading that I want to share with you. And like I said, I have some five stars in here. The first book that I read since the last time we've chatted, um, I do not have a copy of it. I listened to the audio. I would definitely recommend experiencing that book through that medium. It was a great audio. I thought it was read by the author. I think on the last video I was telling you that I was listening to it and I told you it was read by the author. It is not, uh, but she does such a great job. It just sounds like it would be the author talking. There's a fly buzzing around here. <laughs> I guess he wants to book chat. But the book is called The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning, How to Free Yourself, <laughs> How to Free Yourself and Your Family from a Lifetime of Clutter is by Margarita Magnuson. We'll go with that. Um, super enjoyable listen. Like I said, for the last month, I have been just really deep cleaning in the house, trying to get rid of stuff, downsize, um, thinking about where I am in my life. Uh, in April, I turned 50 um, and my husband turned 50 in June and we had a big birthday party. And it really was in my mind heavy about moving into that next section in our life. You know, the next big thing is retirement. Uh, and when we retire, we do intend to sell our house and move um, closer to where our one and only son is in Western Kentucky. And just the thought of having to downsize all of my possessions, pack them up and move into a smaller house makes me very nervous. <laughs> I have a lot of stuff. Um, it's a really weird conversation because people are like, you know, you really shouldn't put that much emphasis on what it is that you own. It's not about the things, it's about the experiences. Yeah, I've had a lot of experiences in my 50 years, which means I gather a lot of things. I am not someone who easily lets go of things. I gather memories. It's not like I buy like expensive pieces of art, but I keep things. One of my students this last Christmas made me a little ornament. It has a book on it. I'm going to keep it forever. A few years ago, my Secret Santa at school made me this Harry Potter um, glass thingy. I love it. It's in my library. My son, when he asked um, one of the girls to prom one year, I think it was, we made paper flowers because she loved to read. I still have it. I am sentimental. I keep things. It's hard to let go. But this book provided a conversation about what to let go of and what it's okay to hold on to and why we really do need to downsize at this point in our life because it is not fair to make the next generation have to deal with all your crap. It's not. I understand that. Um, so it's a conversation that I needed to be a part of. I really enjoyed it. Um, there is some humor in it and there's also some very cringy moments in this book. So I'm just gonna alert you to that. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm listening to a book and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to book chat this book. Like, I really like it. I think that people really need to be listening to this book, especially if you are 50 or over. You need to be reading this book, listening however you want to do it. But there are definitely two points in the book, and I'm not going to give anything away, but there are two points in the book that I'm like, God, what are people going to think when they, you know, listen to this book or they read this book and they're like, she even told me to listen to this? What is that? Like, weird. <laughs> But you know what? It doesn't matter. It does not turn me off to the book. I laughed out loud. Um, and then on one of the other parts, I was just like, ah, even if it were true, why would you say it? <laughs> Whatever that happens. Um, I really enjoyed the book. So this book will encourage you to get your home together, to get your possessions in order, to make sure that you're preparing for your next generation and not placing a burden on them. It's inspirational. It's entertaining. It's even really humorous and cringy. 
One of the things she suggests is um, if you have a collection of some sort, you know, maybe not when I'm 50, but maybe when you're like 60 or 70 or 80, uh, once you see the end is near uh, and you have a collection of something, inviting people to your home and anytime someone's in your home, gifting them something that is special to you that they might want. And making sure that you aren't feeling them, you're not making them feel responsible that they have to keep every item like my mother does when she hands me something and then she will continuously question me about where it is and what I've done with it and that I'm not getting rid of it. Don't do that. She also gives you some tips about having those sensitive conversations with people that you might be doing that with. Like currently I'm working with my parents on getting their estate in order and there are definitely some um, moments that are very uncomfortable when you have to say, what are your funeral plans? Where would you like to be buried? Those conversations are difficult <laughs> and she gives you some tips on that. It makes them a little less overwhelming and a little more logical. One of the things that she mentions is she recommends keeping things that um, you hold dear, like memorabilia, but getting rid of things like extra housewares or extra clothes or presents that people give you, she gives you that permission. If someone is giving you something and it's not your style, you have permission to pass it on. Highly recommend this book. I really enjoyed it. Um, and again, it's one of those that I do think anybody 50 and over, you need to be listening or reading this book. What did I give it? Four out of five. That makes sense. This next one was a five out of five for me. I mean, five out of five, if I could give it more, I would. So you know I'm doing the Agatha Christie group, the uh, discussion online Facebook group. We Zoom about every two weeks-ish. Um, and when this one popped up earlier this year and I saw the cover, I thought, I've got to read that book. It's young adult, it's called The Agathas. I don't have a copy of it. I lit, oh yes, I do have a copy of it. What am I talking about? I bought it. <laughs> this is one of those caught me in a weak moment. I bought it. Isn't that a lovely cover? Look at that cover. It's called The Agathas. It's by Kathleen Gleason and Liz Lawson. I started listening to the audio because I had requested it and it came in and then I just was like, you know how like, I don't like buying books sometimes because I don't know if I'm gonna like them. But once I know I'm gonna like them, I want to own the book so I can pass it around, so I can show it to you, so I can put it on my shelf, so I can pull it back down, I can see it, I can love it. Um, and this was that kind of book. I don't know where I picked it up, I can't remember. I don't know that I made a note of it. I don't think I made a note of it. But this is one of the reasons why I wanted to make this video today. Because you need to request it, you need to buy it, you need to read this book. So at the end of the book, there is a section where the two authors speak to you. It's under the acknowledgments, Liz and Kathleen, and it's like in a dialogue. And at the very end, Liz says her last line is, we hope you love Alice and Iris as much as we do. Well, sister, I do. I loved them. They are characters that I just, I loved them. I care about them. I worried about them. I wanted them to be okay. I do, I do, I do. The story focuses on Alice and Iris. But there are many, many characters throughout the book. It's very Agatha Christie-ish. So it's not just the title that is, um, what do you call that, derivative of Agatha Christie. It is more than just the title. They talk about her, they use quotes, um, and a lot of the Agatha kinds of writing techniques are used in this. And one of those is just way, a lot of characters <laughs> that you have to keep up with. It's very Agatha style. Clearly it is inspired by Agatha Christie's true life disappearance. And that is exactly where we are on our reading journey with the Agatha group. Um, 1927, 28, I believe it was, Agatha Christie had published a couple of books. Her husband told her that he was going to leave her. He had um, another mistress and he leaves. And when he leaves, so does she, she disappears. Um, for 11 days, there is a media frenzy trying to track her down. Sherlock Holmes even got in on the, um, the, the, the search for her. And then she is found after 11 days, and there's a lot of mystery there. I definitely want to read a couple of books about that. I've read some articles. And in that vein, the main character, Alice, disappears. Um, about a year before the book starts, she had some things happen and she disappeared and she has not been forthcoming just like Agatha as to where she was at during that period of time. So very Agatha inspired. Alice and Agatha both just refused to explain themselves. Among the many Agatha Christie um, allusions that are in the book, 
There are also some others. In Cold Blood, Murder, She Wrote, Nancy Drew, uh, Veronica Mars, and Riverdale. So some of my favorites are still in there too. And you know, it's like when you're reading and you come across those um, allusions or references and they're ones that you hold very dear to, you know, like being someone who loves Murder, She Wrote is not normal. I don't have any friends in real life <laughs> that like Murder, She Wrote when they find out that I've, I have watched every episode, they're like, who are you? Like, uh, you know, an 80 year old grandma? Well, yeah, kind of, kind of. I loved In Cold Blood. I think I've even recommended it to you. Even the setting of the book is in Scooby-Doo's hometown. It's Castle Cove. Now this book, <laughs> I had already in my mind been thinking on the Agatha Christie books that I definitely need to make a murder board when I'm reading these. I've still yet to do that. It's one of those like, I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna make a video for you, but I haven't done it. But I did on a piece of paper, like keep a track of their murder board as they are investigating a murder. Um, I don't know why. I'm I need to put this up here, <laughs> but I'm probably gonna keep grabbing it. But they make a murder board, they make a murder book. There is a horse chase, there are roller skates. And seriously, I am here for every page of this book. Every minute is just enjoyable, enjoyable fun. The format of the book is just um, very current. I know I like true crime podcasts and I have a lot of students that listen to them and this is for you. Some of the formatting of the alternating voices because you hear from Alice, you hear from Iris. It's kind of like a docu-fiction. It even has like the five fast fun facts like um, one of those articles, the listicles that you see online. And I am always a sucker for a book that has like opening quotes and these all have opening quotes. And of course they're opening quotes from Agatha Christie novels. These blondes, sir, they're responsible for a lot of trouble. Agatha Christie, The Labors of Hercules. The Agatha Christie quotes are like all over the book. And then um, when I'm talking to you about like the murder board, um, you know, there, it's not like a illustration, but you definitely get the feel. You can understand like how it works. Um, they'll have like a little list like that. The characters often quote Agatha Christie or Perot or Miss Marple. And I have not yet met Miss Marple. So as much as I've talked about Agatha Christie, I've never read a Marple mystery. Um, I think it's two or three books from where we are right now. We're on number 11 currently in our chronological reading group, but I'm excited to meet Miss Marple. This is definitely the book for people who like books like One of Us is Lying, Who Killed Zos Thanos, Good Girl's Guide to Murder, and I think I've talked to you about all of those books. If not, I will review them for you and put those together because it's a genre that I especially enjoy. And if you like one of those books, you would like any of these. Now, like One of Us is Lying is very dark. There is no humor. I enjoyed it. It was a good thriller, but it's dark. This, even though there are like missing people, murderers, blah, blah, blah. It's not dark. I loved every minute of it. It was enjoyable. I was smiling while I read it. I was laughing while I read it. I would recommend this book a thousand, thousand, thousand times. I absolutely love it. Oh, here's, I forgot that I put it in my little stack here. Here's the uh, murder board um, that I was keeping notes on. It was like, here's the missing person. Here are the people that we consider suspects. Here are some of the reasons why. Um, I think that would be super fun to make a murder board. I just haven't done it yet. I keep saying I'm going to do it. It was one of the things I was going to do this summer. And now I don't even know what the date is. The 21st, that's a teacher talking for you. I think it's the 21st of July. Um, school starts in less than a month. Uh, I'm so not ready for it this time. I don't know why. Like summer's been so enjoyable, so relaxing. I haven't gotten near what I wanted to get done, done, but my house is in order. <laughs> so that's something. Let me see if there's other things that I've marked in here I want to share with you. Somewhere, um, I think that I saw that this was recommended for like ages 14 and up, and I'd say that's probably about accurate. Um, if you are an adult like me, um, even if you work with kids, if you work with teenagers, I think we've kind of lost sight of what is age appropriate <laughs> because my excuse is always like, look, I know what these kids are doing, saying, watching, reading, like they're more mature than their years, but not all of them. So if I'm gonna say like blanket number, give me a number, I'd say about 14 and up. I don't think that there, I don't remember there being a lot of language, if any, but there are some situations that are a little more like, these are teenagers. So um, usually that's kind of, 
how I decide what a book is, who a book is appropriate for, is what are the age of the characters that are in the book? Are they doing age appropriate things? And kind of going from there. So I would say about 13 to 14 and up would probably really appreciate this book. Um, it's a pretty smart book. Like I said, you got to get some references. You're going to have to know what well, you don't have to know, but um, you would enjoy it more if you got those references to the Agatha Christie, to the In Cold Blood, um, to Nancy Drew. If you got some of those references, it would be more enjoyable. So here's a little section about that murder board. I already have the room set up. A stack of spiral notebooks sit on a marble coffee table along with a bag full of string and note cards. To the side is a big cork board with wheels that we used for schoolwork during my house arrest. She's on house arrest because she disappeared on her, mm, whatever. It's now our more, it's now our murder board. Iris walks over to the materials sitting on the table, poking through them, and then she looks up at me. Nice work, Ovalby. Thank you. I flush a little and I turn to face the board so that she doesn't see. I'm not exactly used to hearing compliments from my family or friends. I figure we can use this to map everything out. Perot always talks about order and method in investigations, and this is a good way to get organized. I love it. I, I just love it. It does shift back and forth. Like it starts off, oh, look, I forgot. There is, um, I like the dedication to best friends, teen detectives everywhere. It's also dedicated to Agatha Christie. Okay, there's a little language in the dedication, so I guess there was a little language in there, but it's appropriate. It's appropriate language. There is a map of Castle Cove, which you do need to know because you're following people around. And then some of the book um, is just like traditional novel, right? Just like reading a novel. But then sometimes you're following like a group thread on text. And sometimes you are reading the transcript to a news broadcast. So the format is all over the place. I enjoy those kinds of books. It keeps me on my toes. So if that's the kind of book that you like and you like true crime or docufiction, this is the book you want to put on your to be read list. I loved it. I can't say enough about it. Highly, highly recommend. It's another five star read for me. The Agathas. The next book that I read, very small one. Um, it's called The Key to Personal Peace. It's by Billy Graham. Look how super tiny it is. Um, even these super tiny books, though, always take me a while to get through because I only read like a chapter at a time during my devotional time in the morning, um, which right now has been on the front porch and it's been spectacular, unless the tree removal guys are there, which uh, changed my landscaping a little bit. But um, I really enjoyed this book. Now, I do have to say, I know in my videos, I've talked a little bit about my religious journey. Um, and I do have to say that as much as I respect and have good feelings toward Billy Graham, I wasn't sure he was someone that I would appreciate his writing. He's a bit evangelical for me. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised. I loved this book. I gave it a five out of five. I think it's kind of taken from some other things, if I'm not mistaken. I'm glad I finally got around to reading it. It's only 57 pages. It's super short. You can read a little chapter at a time just while you're trying to center yourself in the morning, maybe. That's what I did. It's very inspirational. It is religious, though, and it definitely is a motivational read for um, those of us that are seeking peace. And if you're not someone who's seeking peace, then we all want to know what your secret is <laughs> because I feel like we are all seeking peace in our lives. Honestly, I haven't read a lot of Billy Graham's work. I know about him. I was raised in a church. I was raised in a Southern Baptist church. So you would think at some point I would have read something by him, but I haven't. It's introduced as a book that was put out in a response to 9-11, a time when a lot of Americans were really questioning what was going on. I feel like we can kind of relate that to the pandemic. When the pandemic hit and we were all like, you have to stay in your house and you have to be away from people we all turned in and we were very introspective on what is the meaning of life? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to react to that? And this book really does help with that. Graham keeps it very simple and to the point. Um, and again, I've told you I've been in church since the day I was born. Um, so I'm not someone who has a no basis um, in religious writing or thought. Um, and even with that, this does not dumb it down for me. It's just simple to the point and honest, which I really, really love. I appreciate that. 
Apparently he wrote a book called Peace with God and this is maybe taken out of that, taken like some of the main teachings coming out of that book. I found myself underlining throughout the book just statements that really rang true with me. One of those was the soul actually demands as much attention as the body. And I thought it does, doesn't it? Like, yes, every day I'm seeking, trying to drink enough water and eat healthy foods and exercise, move my body. But at the same time, every day I am working very hard on connecting with my soul and making sure that I'm living out my truth. I know I have in my videos complained about some of the devotional books that I've read. Um, so I don't want you to think that I am just down on devotional books. I mean, look how the 57 pages, super simple. And I don't have one complaint about this book. I connected with what Billy Graham was trying to say. So apparently it's not when I'm complaining about devotional books, it's not the simplicity that bothers me. This one functions more as like a reminder of the foundations of our faith. Highly recommend five out of five stars. Let me make sure there's nothing else that I really want to read out loud to you. So he opens it up and says that he's writing this book. If you are searching for something you've never had, if you're searching for something that was more important than anything else in life, all people are traveling with you. Everyone is on the same quest. We are aware of the increasing tempo of the spirit of revolution that is sweeping away established landmarks and traditions of the speed with which language, fashions, customs, housing, our ways of living and thinking are being altered. Do you see what I mean? Like it really just like hits home. Like I feel those words. This was published in 2003. He mentions that there are two kinds of happiness. When our circumstances are pleasant and then a lasting joy, a lasting inner joy and peace that come with any circumstance. Our responsibility is to turn to Christ in faith and repentance, turning from our sins and asking him to come into our hearts by faith. We determine to change the course of our lives and we acknowledge our inability to do this apart from God's help. So um, yes, there's some maybe evangelistic moments in there, which I don't mind. I know we are called to evangelize. Um, I just am still, after all these years, uncomfortable with some of the language of evangel evan evangelism. I found it a very hopeful, inspirational, life-affirming book. Next book, five stars. I don't have a copy of it, but I highly, highly, highly recommend this book. Now there are a lot of books that I say, this is right for this audience, this is right for everybody. This book is not right for everybody, but I love it and I highly recommend it. So let me tell you about it and you can see if you think it's for you. It's called Razor Blade Tears. It's by S.A. Crosby. My sister listened to this book, I'd say probably a year ago, maybe. Maybe not quite a year, but something like that. And as soon as she did, she said, you need to read this book. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna put it on my list, you know. And then it just kept coming back and coming back and coming back and we would be talking and she'd say, have you read Razor Blade Tears? And I hadn't. Finally, I got it on audio. Um, I think I had to wait a long time for it too, but finally I got it on audio and I wish I would have listened to it sooner. I loved it. It's ridiculously good. It's disturbing. This is why it's not right for everybody. It's disturbing. It deals with issues that you may not be comfortable with they are challenging. There is a lot of language. Some of the situations are extremely uncomfortable. There were a couple of times that I was so worried about these fictional characters. I just, I worried, I worried for them. <laughs> But as much as it's horrifying and heartbreaking and terrifying, it is beautiful. But I'm here for it. It's an emotional roller coaster, but I am so here for it. The story is based on two dads. They're brought together because both of their sons were married and had a child together and were killed in a hate crime. So the one dad has the child. He and his wife are trying to raise this child. Um, neither of the dads had a great relationship with their gay sons uh, prior to the hate crime. So that makes it very difficult because now they have no way of rectifying that relationship. Um, and their deaths are not being, they're not finding justice for the deaths of their sons. The police are not making any progress. No one's talking to the police. Uh, both of these guys, both of these dads are felons. 
Um, they have served time, they've had rough lives, and they take matters into their own hands. So I did listen to the audio on this one. It is not for the faint of heart. You might want to like not put your windows down if you're listening to it in the car. Like I said, some strong language, very uncomfortable situations, but it's hard. Grief is hard. When people die without you making your peace with them, it's hard. So it just, it all makes sense. It's appropriate language. It's appropriate situations. Those themes of grief and um, just torment, revenge, vengeance, um, they call for some of those crude phrases that come out. It is appropriate to the situation. It is very honest. It's very necessary to move that story along because they are telling their story. This book is gonna hit you in the face with some racist comments, so I'm just gonna throw that right out there. But again, the racist comments are part of the story. It definitely paints a picture and it's honest thoughts from the characters at the time of their journey. So appreciate that, honor that. Even though I was listening to it, there were times when I really did want to read the book in print, but the voices, um, the narration is superb. Like narration for me will make or break a story and this one was perfect. But I wanted the book in print because there were some really beautiful lines that I even stopped, rewound, and then wrote them down. Um, and this is a good example. The gun jumped out of his hands like a gingerbread man making a run for it. Isn't that a beautiful line? Isn't that a beautiful picture? It makes me want to read it in print and underline those beautiful sentences. The characters are very relatable. They demand my sympathy. So you feel for them when they are grieving, when they are angry, when they are frustrated. It's like you feel it. They are very sympathetic characters. Uh, the one dad says every time, every minute I'm not grieving, I'm letting my son down. Every minute I'm not grieving, I'm letting my son down. And I can see that. I can feel that if I lost my child, anytime I smiled or laughed or was happy, I would feel guilty. Like you identify with these characters. I have to say I read a lot. I do. I read a lot of books. It's true. So it is still very uncommon that the moment that I realize what is happening in the story the moment i realize like who the killer is or oh no oh no this is where that's going is pretty uncommon for me and this is that story that it was like what i i remember the moment that i thought no no don't don't do that that's going to be really really awful and it was awful <laughs> I know who it is, it's thrilling, it lives up to the word thriller, it is so, so good. Um, I envy you for being able to read it for the first time and have those realizations and listening to those sentences. Five stars, razor blade tears, read it or listen to it if you are willing to push yourself a little bit and get out of that comfort zone with maybe language, situations. Like I said, racist comments that are accurately placed on the characters at the right time um, when they're trying to like work through. Like, I, I don't think I even said that. One of the dads is white and one of the dads is black. Um, and they did not have any contact at all when their sons were alive. And then they're pulled together by their, you know, joined um, need for justice uh, or vengeance, however it ends up being. And because of that, um, they're dealing with those race issues as well as dealing with the fact that their sons are gay and they, you know, they were not comfortable with that when the boys were alive. So you got a lot of issues going on here. Um, and the author just does a spectacular job of pulling you through that journey. I loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. Five stars. My next book is an Agatha one, so I had to go get my Agatha folder. It's Mystery of the Blue Train. While I was over there, I picked up this, which I think I've talked to you about before, my novel companion. Um, and I have really enjoyed like tracking my reading this year through this little journal. Um, each month, like I write the books that I'm reading, reviewing, or if I have a meeting about the book. Um, and then I'm tracking like how many pages I read. 
Uh, and I've not done that before, so I've really kind of enjoyed that. I just wanted to briefly share that with you. Maybe I'll go into um, a quick flip of that later, not in this video. But uh, the next book I wanted to talk to you about is Mystery of the Blue Train by Agatha Christie. So I gave this one a four out of five. It wasn't my least favorite, but it wasn't my favorite. I do love the book though, the cover there. And as always, I'll give you a nice brief one on this, but of course we talk for like two hours over the book. Um, and I hope to do an Agatha Christie only uh, book video in the future. But uh, for now, I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about this one. I did really like it. This is our ninth book chronologically reading Agatha Christie. It's our ninth uh, novel. Yeah, we're doing short stories too. So what I realized this last time, like in the summer, one day I just went out on the porch, pulled out all my Agatha Christie um, notes and articles and books and just tried to get a hold of everything. And I realized it's super complicated. It's not as easy as saying one, two, three, four, five, because you have novels, you have short stories. Um, you have short story collections, you have plays. It's just, it's not that simple. But we are following a particular list from the Agatha Christie um, official website. And so we're gonna say that this is number nine in our chronologically published Agatha Christie's. It's our number six Perot, which makes it for me one of my favorites because I love the Agatha Christie Perot novels. Um, I find him just darling. <laughs> He's so charming. He's the perfect character that I like to read. In this particular one, she has a great dedication. She says, dedicated to two distinguished members of the OFD, Carlotta and Peter. You're like, the OFD, what's that? Well, this is during the time in Agatha Christie's life when her husband left her. She disappeared for 11 days and she realized who her friends were and who her friends were not. So the OFD, is the Order of the Faithful Dogs because two of the people that she really um, felt like stuck with her uh, were her dog and um, her uh, like personal assistant. I don't think the dog's name is Peter though. I don't remember who that was. <laughs> but I do like it's the Order of the Faithful Dogs. Obviously her most famous train mystery is Murder on the Orient Express, but before the Murder on the Orient Express, there was the Mystery of the Blue Train. This was written during a time in her life when she was really in turmoil. So even Agatha has commented and said, this is not her favorite book. She really struggled to write a book while she was going through all these personal struggles. Um, and I think it was her brother-in-law came in and like helped her take some of the things that she had published um, or was working on and kind of put them together. And he really helped get this book out because she was under contract. She had to get a book out. I also have to say that I usually read the books and then watch the TV adaptations and this TV adaptation does not closely match this book at all. It lacks Hastings as a narrator in the book and in the movie and um, it shows because then it's basically just like straight dialogue a lot of the time. You don't get the narration of um, you know Hastings observing how things are working. But even with all of that, it still creates a lot of it still contains a lot of great quotes that show us more about the character Perot. And it still has a lot of the things that we're starting to track in our group that we realize that Christy is really good at. Things like um, there are way too many characters, there are some masking or disguises going on, um, the themes of love and betrayal, um, and then ultimately justice and what Perot sees as justice. So um, it's a very Agatha novel, but yeah, it's not my favorite either. Um, I'm with Christy on that, and I can appreciate the fact that she was going through some personal struggles and maybe it's not her best work. But still, <laughs> um, because we were reading all of the Agathas in order, I still appreciated it, and I still gave it a four out of five. It's just not my favorite. I talked to you about some of the other June books in the last video. Uh, when I filmed it, I had dabbled in June but hadn't finished. So that sums up June for me. And now we'll talk about July. So the next one is this one. Um, and again, like I, I, all my books that are in here are mainly books that I've read, fiction books, some nonfiction, mainly the nonfiction that I have, or mainly the nonfiction that I've read so far. Um, and then some cookbooks and like my short stack is in here. I have a whole nother um, set of books in the front entryway 
on a, um, it's like a ladder that has three shelves on it. And that's where a lot of my nonfiction um, books are. And at the beginning of the summer, I just plucked some off of there that I knew that I wanted to read during my devotional time. And I picked this one up. Um, but I'll tell you right off the bat, this one's a three out of five for me. I can appreciate it, but mm, on the recommendation for it, I would say. Um, it was just okay. It was just okay. So it's called The Tree That Did Not Want to Die. It's by Eugene Carr. It has paintings by Kirby Brock. I have absolutely no idea where this book came from. Um, it's not by a big publisher. It's a small publishing press. Foreign publishing. So I don't even know what that is. Um, and, you know, I appreciated it. The concept of it, I think, is what draws me to it. But just didn't love it. But I'm not a big poetry fan to start with. And it's written as like a long poem. So there is that. I mean, I do recognize that's not my best genre. It starts off with um, a preface by the author where he says, I wonder how the tree felt about it. Obviously, we're talking about the crucifixion. When this first, when this thought first came to me, where I was, what I was doing at the time, I do not know. Thoughts have a way of invading the mind at times and places of their own choosing. Perhaps I was writing a suburb, and that's like, I don't know. I'm just, I don't connect with the author on this one. Um, it is broken up into parts. There is a part one where we follow the tree when they go to um, pick a tree for the crucifixion. And we learn a little bit about the tree. It's in the, the tree's point of view. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it just didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Um, I know when I did share that I had read this, like on Goodreads, I put the review out there that... My friend Stephanie, who teaches English, she was like, is it like, and then um, I'll have to link that for you below, but she said there's another like classic poem that we study that comes from the tree's point of view. And so I clicked on that and read it and it was like 10 times better than this one. So read that one, maybe not this one, um, but it's okay. I, you know, I never like to say, oh my gosh, it's terrible. And it's not terrible. It's just, eh, it's just eh for me. It was published in 1977. It does have a very 1977 feel. When I went to review it on Goodreads, there was not an entry for this. It did get added after that, after I sent in the, um, the information like uh, to the <laughs> Goodreads librarians, I guess, whenever I'm like, hey, I would like this added, they did add it. Um, it's theologically, I feel like, correct in telling the story. So if you know, you're wondering like, is it a religious book? Yes, I do think it is. It follows theologically the crucifixion story. So I would classify it as religious or inspirational fiction. Um, there are a lot of characters that you would recognize like Pilate and Herod um, are in the story. So, you know, completed it, didn't love it, but it was short. It's written kind of in a poem format. The next book I read because our book club um, was going to Savannah and we were reading Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which I have read years ago, and I actually added a, um, a Goodreads review on there for you, because I highly recommend that. And that book is by John Brett. I have a copy of The Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, but I loaned it to my friend that lives in South Carolina because she had not read it, um, and she lives right by Savannah there. So I'm like, you have to read this book. It's really, really good. Um, now, while we were down there, she said, hey, let's watch the movie too. So um, I've already seen the movie, but watching it again, it is a little bit dated. I still enjoyed it because I love true crime and that whole thing. The Savannah history is super interesting. <clears throat> I love the characters of it. So I added that review online to The Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Um, it, let me find the right one. I read the book in 2006 before we were taking a family trip to Savannah. Um, and I remember like I'm reading it, we're headed to Savannah, it was my, my idea. And as I'm reading this book and it's like a city of like the underbelly of the city, like crime and murder. And I'm like, might not have been the best place to take my <laughs> young son and husband to. Um, but we all enjoyed it. We went to Tybee Island and then we visited some of Savannah. I did not know that there was such an underbelly in Savannah, but flavor, it gives flavor to Savannah. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is told from the first person narrative of um, a journalist who went down there to write a story and got caught up at the right time of being there when this murder happened. And it was somebody that he had just met and was interviewing. It the murder actually took place in 1981. 
And I should say that it was a killing, um, not necessarily a murder. I don't know if that's, I mean, I feel like that's probably appropriate to say because he claims self-defense. So is that murder? I mean, I mean, you kill someone, but if it's not like in cold blood, then is it murder? I'm not sure. I'm gonna say this author's last name is Brent. I'm not sure if that's how he says it, but he does a superb job of helping us get to know those characters and learn the story in just a really laid back kind of way. It's not like a thriller page turner. It's a, hey, come for a visit. This happened while you were here on your visit, which is very much the story of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. But you meet things like the town's antique dealer, um, a gigolo that is well known in the city or the town town, city, city, uh, a drag queen, a voodoo woman, um, just a myriad of all these characters that just add a particular flavor to Savannah. And they all have a part in, um, they all play a part in this murder that happens or this killing that happens. It's like a Greek chorus of characters who all come together and have a part to play in this crime that happened, this tragedy that happened. Tragedy, let's go with that. It's an amazingly told tale. I highly, highly recommend uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And when you read the book, it's like you want to go to Savannah, you want to see these people, you want to see these places, and because you're like, can this really be real? It is, and they are. So because I had read that, I had a copy of this, and um, since I had already read that for my book club, since I had already read that book before we discussed it in book club, um, and I had this other book by the author, then I wanted to read it. Um, I wanted to read this other book by him. And it is called The City of Falling Angels. Um, and so I did read it. It's not quite the page turner that uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is. And I know I told you it wasn't like a thriller page turner, but it is, um, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is a more interesting story, I guess, than this one. I don't even know if I want to say more interesting. It's just a more um, violent, true crime kind of story than this particular one. But the two are very similar in the way that John Brent writes. Um, so in this particular story, we are not in Savannah. We are across the ocean in Venice, Italy. And now it's not 1981, it's 1996. Um, and again, the author gets there right when something happens, um, and then he writes the story about it. So you get those rich characterizations again, uh, where we meet a lot of the people that are playing into the city of Venice. It is a story about Venice, just like Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is a story about Savannah and a crime that takes place. This is about the city of Venice and a crime that takes place. This time it's arson. It's the Fennis opera house that is, uh, burns to the ground and he follows the story of how that might have come about. I enjoyed it. <clears throat> I would suggest taking your time to read this one. You don't need to like finish it in three days. You can take your time, pick it up, lay it down, pick it up, take, um, lay it down um, without feeling that urgency to get to the end where Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, there is a bit of urgency. It might not be a true page turner, but there is a bit of urgency to figure out what led to one guy shooting the other in the other book. It's just that the crime doesn't quite propel the story in this as much as it does in the Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. If you asked me if I wanted to read about the burning down of an opera house in Venice, Italy, I would probably not have gone out and purchased this book. I just picked it up somewhere knowing that I knew that author's name, but I really appreciated reading it. I would read more, I would read any book that this author writes because I like his style of writing, the characterization, the um, telling the background of a story. I just, I really like it. I think he's a very good writer. I don't know how he gets away with telling such hard truths though, because in Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and in this one, when he is putting together a character, telling you their story, it's not always flattering. <laughs> um, and so I'm not sure why so many people say, sure, come on in, get to know me, tell me, tell the whole world what you think about me. Like, um, I don't know how he gets away with that. He starts the book talking to someone who says, you can't trust Venetians, they never tell the truth. And then he tells you the whole story and then he brings it back to that. And I just think that again is masterful. There is quite a bit of name dropping in this one, like some names that I recognize, probably more that I did not. Um, but I'm sure that people who are interested in Venice or the opera would know more of that name dropping. Um, but there are extended pieces in here that I really was interested in. 
and one of those was the author Ezra Pound. There is a whole section talking to you about the estate of Ezra Pound and about his story that I did not know and I thought was very interesting. Although I'm adding him to my list of famous guys who I detest their personal lives. So, you know, that's a pretty big list. If you start thinking like there are a lot of writers or famous people that are well known for their good works or their, um, you know, like Ezra Pound for his literary work. And then when you learn about how they conducted themselves, like in their private lives, you're just like, well, you're a stinker. <laughs> like, and that is definitely Ezra Pound in this book, but I found it very interesting. So I do recommend this one. Read Midnight in the Garden of Evil first, because then you will be more patient with this writer in this one. Um, and so I don't see where my, uh, what I rated it, but I'm guessing I probably rated this a four out of five. Glad I read it. Now, for some reason, I always get Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and The Devil in the White City confused. Like, I always think they're by the same author, and they are not. But I did go and put a, um, a review on Goodreads for you um, for Devil in the White City because I think if you like Midnight in the Garden of Evil, you would like Devil in the White City. And somewhere along the line, I think I probably mentioned it to you, and then I realized I didn't have a Goodreads review out there for you. So I'm going to talk to you about that one now. It is Eric Larson, um, Devil in the White City. And I feel like I should have a copy of that book. I don't know. I must have loaned it out. I'm not seeing it. I don't know why I can't put my hands on it because I feel like I do have a copy of it. That's okay, though. Um, but it's called The Devil in the White City, Murder, Magic, and Madness at the Fair that Changed America. It's by Eric Larson, who I know I've talked to you about some of his other books, but I just didn't have this review on there. Um, so... I read it back in 2008. I remember vividly, you know how some of those books you just remember when you were reading? I was reading it on spring break. We were in Florida. I was staying up late reading and I got to the part where I had to finish the book and it's spooky in the end. Like there's some supernatural weirdness going on in the end. So this is a nonfiction book. Um, it tells two different stories. It alternates between talking to you about the World's Fair at the turn of the century I don't see the 19th century Chicago, 1893. Um, and it follows that World's Fair. Um, and then it alternates telling you about a serial killer in Chicago and telling you his story. Um, what's his name? H.H. H. Holmes. Uh, and it is ugh, spine chilling. <clears throat> Highly recommend this one. This is up there on my one of my favorite reads of all time. Um, and when I recently looked at Goodreads, I have like 1,500 books-ish on there that I've read and reviewed um, or read, read and reviewed some. I don't know how it works. Whatever. So that's saying a lot, but this is up there. This is one of my favorites. <clears throat> I uh, Back in the fall, I listened to Eric Larson's No One Goes Alone. It's a ghost story that he wrote, but he only released it um, on the audio. And I know I've talked to you about that one. Highly recommend that. And um, so he's good at telling spooky tales. Oh, I know I also picked up The Splendid and the Vile by him. That's on my short list. This has gotten great reviews. The Splendid and the Vile's Eric Larson, um, the saga of Churchill family and defiance during the Blitz. Um, so I picked that up at Thrift. I think I'm going to talk to you about that during the book haul today or else I already have. I don't remember. Um, but <clears throat> super excited to find this one. And this is on my reading list. So we'll put that one up there for you to look at. So in the uh, 1893, for, when they were building the World's Fair, um, Daniel H. Burnham is the main architect. So you follow him along, but at the same time that he is building the Chicago World's Fair in 1890, what was it, three, um, we are following a serial killer who is taking advantage of how they're building that World's Fair. So because it is drawing a lot of workers there, even girls that are coming in like to work at the restaurants or the hotels or whatever that they're doing. This is, you know, back in the time way before, um, you could quickly just call or send a text and say, hey, I got there safely. My son sent a text at like four o'clock this morning that he got home. Um, he was driving back from Florida to Western Kentucky and it does, it makes me sleep better knowing that he got there safely. Uh, but these girls were unable to do that. So sometimes it would be months before someone realized hey, we haven't heard from Sally who went to go work at that restaurant in Chicago, wonder what happened. And then trying to navigate finding these girls, H.H. H. Holmes was taking advantage of that. 
Um, I did go to the 1982 Knox, Knoxville World's Fair. I should have worn that t-shirt today. That would have been a good one because I do have one from them. Um, not like one that I purchased when I was there, but like when I've been thrifting, I picked up like a vintage one. Um, so daggone it, I should have worn that. Um, anywho, having gone to that World's Fair, it is over. I still remember, I think, I, I don't know, 1982, I was 10 years old. Um, I still remember just how overwhelming that World's Fair was and thinking they built all of this just for this. Like there are buildings, there are statues, there just, just for this. Um, and so it is just, it's a feat. It's ridiculously complicated to get to pull that off. Um, when's the last time we've had a World Fair in America? Hmm, I don't know, that's interesting. Anywho, it takes over a city. So it goes back and forth between Burnham overcoming the obstacles to build that World's Fair and then H.H. H. Holmes, who is this charming doctor um, who has this atrocity going on in his basement um, where he has like a crematorium and a gas chamber and just, it's horrific. So this is not for the faint of heart. It's horrifying to say the least, but it is a great true crime book. So true crime, even though the podcast may be something that's new, um, the genre of the books is not. And I've been reading those for a long time uh, and really enjoying those. It's full of historical details, but it's told like in that novel novelized format that I really like. Like um, I like nonfiction, but when I'm reading one of these novelized true crime stories, it just helps me connect with it a little bit better. There are some other mentions of famous people in there at the time, but Burnham and Holmes really just carry the story along. I loved it. I highly recommend it. Like I said, I read it back in 2008 and it's still one of my favorites. Five out of five, but I didn't read it this year. It looks like I recommended No One Goes Alone by Eric Larson to you back in November of 2021. All right, this next author, again, my sister has told me to read this. Um, author for a very long time and what did I do I took way too long to get to it but winter in paradise by I'm gonna say Eileen Hildebrand I'm pretty sure that's right um, and lucky for me my sister gave me several of these Let's stick that over there um, several of these books so I'm ready to do the next one but I read the first one and she's right I loved it I should have read it sooner let me grab some of those other books okay so I think it was my birthday she gave me this matchmaker trouble in paradise troubles in paradise and this one which is what happens in paradise so i think it goes winter in paradise what happens in paradise and then troubles in paradise dun, dun, dun. that's a pretty picture isn't it and then this matchmaker might be a standalone maybe so I need to do a summer reading video for you. But if I were doing a summer reading video for you, she would definitely be there. Obviously you see the beach scene, but I think when it said winter in paradise, I was like, well, that's kind of weird. I mean, yeah, you're on a beach and it's the winter. And I don't know, it's kind of weird, um, but totally works. This is the first in the paradise trilogy. This is the trilogy minus matchmaker there. And it has me hooked for sure. Irene Steele is the main character. She is a middle-aged woman. I can relate. Um, she's meeting her friend on New Year's or New Year's Eve. I'm not sure which one it is. And it's one of the girlfriends that she has recently felt sorry for. Um, she feels bad for those friends of hers who have husbands who are philanderers um, or just they don't have good relationships. But she doesn't think she's one of those women. So she's sitting there, she's pitying this woman, but they're good, good friends. They have an annual tradition of meeting on New Year's or New Year's Eve, whichever one it is. Um, and they're just talking and she can relate, you know, it makes sense. Um, she can commiserate. But then when she returns home, she receives a phone call that completely upends her life. It's that dreaded middle of the night phone call um, that you have nightmares about, uh, like when my notification went off this morning at the 4 a.m. That's never good news. So I was glad when I turned around and looked at it, it was good news. My son was home. I didn't even know he was gonna travel all night to get home. Um, my husband had already left for a fishing trip um, just for today, but still he was up and at him early this morning. So, you know, when the phone rings after he's left that early in the morning, I feel like, oh no, this can't be good. Um, but Eileen's phone call is not so good. 
She receives information that her husband has died in a plane crash. She knows he's traveling for business, but she doesn't realize where he is. Nothing matches up with what she thought. He's not where he was supposed to be. Um, and then just the details don't make sense for her. So she decides to travel to where the accident happened, which is St. John's Island. St. John Island in the Virgin Islands. Is it St. John, St. John's? I think it's St. John, I think I even checked that. St. John, yes. <laughs> um, so it's in the Virgin Islands, which technically is still part of the United States. But honestly, when she gets on that plane and travels there, it is like she is leaving her old life behind. She is already starting to put together that these details don't make sense to her. So she's not super surprised when she gets there when things start unraveling. My husband came in when I redid the bookshelves and I was like, come look, see what I've done. And he said, why would you ever do that? Why would you ever turn them so that you can't see the spine? So in case you've been wondering that same thing for the last however many minutes this turns out to be, um, it's because I do have madness to the order. I'm a very orderly person. I have too much, but it is in order. Um, so I group like things together and then all of the books that I have, I'm starting to shift them to their relationship with my YouTube videos. So if I've talked to you about them, if I've read them, or if I've just mentioned them, if they're on my to be read list, or um, if I um, have books that are by authors I've already talked to you on YouTube, but I haven't talked about their other books yet, or I haven't even said, hey, this is on my to be read list, that's why they're like that. And I will hopefully um, make more progress, make videos more often so that I can talk to you about those. And then we'll turn those over and they will be like these, books that I have not read yet, but I have talked to you about. Anywho, once she gets to St. John Island, she finds the second life that her husband has been leading. He has a second family, or at least a mistress. Like she's not even, she's trying to put it together and she is calm and she is collected. Um, you know, she has always been a businesswoman and knows how to keep her head in the game. And she also has been very aware of her age. So it's like, um, and I get this again, it's very relatable. Once you get to be a certain age, you are past the point where people see you in a certain light. Um, you can no longer be emotional without people drawing attention to it attention to it and think you're having a breakdown and she doesn't want to be that person. So she very calmly starts gathering all the evidence of what is going on so that she can deal with it in an appropriate manner. So she's trying to figure out he has this mistress, possibly more, but something funky is going on with his work. They won't return her phone calls when she calls a line like it's disconnected. There is something weird going on here. But it's not necessarily, I wouldn't call it a mystery. I wouldn't call it a thriller. Um, it is definitely a romance-ish kind of book because she's making her way there. It doesn't get steamy. Um, mm, wrong. There's more than just, um, there's more than just Irene in the story. Her two adult sons fly down there too and they meet her there. Um, and it does, there is some steamy stories with the son and some people that he, uh, girl that he meets there. I'm trying not to give too much away. Um, so it does get a little steamy there. I forgot about that part. But when she gets down there, she meets Ayers, Huck, and Maya. Um, her sons, Cash and Baker, are there. They actually complicate things by being there. They're supposed to be there in support of their mother, but even though they're both adults, they're both going through adult traumas, um, tribulations. Uh, again, it's very realistic. It's not like people just grow up and move on. We, we just continuously have other battles that we're fighting, and they're, um, they're in that area of their life too. Um, in their current journeys. But while she's down there finding out about these other relationships that her husband has had that she knows nothing about, she actually ends up making some relationships of her own. And that's part of the story that you can see that's gonna start unfolding maybe in the trilogy that I'm really looking forward to because I really like these characters. I like Irene. I like, um, what is his name? Huck. I like Ayers. I like Maya or Mia, I'm not sure how you say it. I like these characters. I want to hear their stories. That's what makes a good series because you want to know more. I thoroughly enjoyed this first book in the series. I'm looking forward to reading more of Eileen Hillenbrand's and especially more of this particular series. I need to get at least another one in before the end of the summer because it does have a very summer feel to it. 
So this is for the 50-ish year old woman who is looking for a page turner. Not necessarily a thriller, but definitely has some secrets that are unfolding. And it's definitely by an author who you can tell understands us. She doesn't think that middle-aged women are invisible. <laughs> really enjoyed it. I gave it a five out of five. I mean, I did because I really enjoyed it. Um, and you know, like I'm always a little leery about the whole rating of books, but I gave it a five out of five because um, of how enjoyable it was, how I just wanted to keep getting the book and going out on the porch and reading. I really enjoyed it. So highly recommend Ellen Hildebrand and especially the Paradise series. I also borrowed from my sister, find it, the summer of 69. She had loaned this to me probably last summer, I guess. Um, and I haven't made it to it, so I need to read this and get this back to her. So I probably should read this before I continue with the um, Paradise series. It says that I also have one called Castaways. I don't know why I'm not seeing that. Almost missed it. I do have one more by her called Castaways. It's a little paperback, so I need to be reading that one too. Looks like in my book haul series, I have one called The Blue Bistro um, that I got from the book Rack and Murray, so I'll be covering that in the book haul portion. Okay, so there's another book that I wanted to talk to you about. It's down here. Uh, called The Pilot's Wife. Uh, while I was reading this one about um, her going down there and finding out that her husband had a second family, um, it reminded me of this book. It's by Anita Shreve. It was part of Oprah's Book Club. Um, it's got a little sticker on it, so I think I probably picked this up after I had read it. Um, but I read it back when I was watching Oprah every day. I am that person. <laughs> I used to watch Oprah every afternoon at four o'clock for decades. Um, and I definitely was a big part of the book club. Like she, it worked. She got me reading. Like I enjoyed the books. I liked um, having read them before they had the discussions. And I liked a lot of the books that she picked for her Oprah's book club. Um, and this is one of them. It's by Anita Shreve. It's called The Pilot's Wife. So I put a review out there for you um, on Goodreads. Um, Anita Shreve has another book called Sea Glass. So I put a review for that one too. Um, so I wanted to add both of those for you. But I do highly recommend The Pilot's Life, The Pilot's Wife. Um, it's another one that has really stuck with me all these years. I read it back in 1999. But when I was reading Winter in Paradise, I know I've read several books that talk about someone having a second life or a second family, um, but this is definitely one that always comes to mind. <clears throat> this is dark. Winter in Paradise, um, even though it sounds tragic and horrifying and the themes are terrible, um, it really is um, a more uplifting book. Um, Irene is able to deal with a tough situation in a very positive way, and they're in St. John, so <laughs> there is that. Whereas Pilot's Wife, lots darker. Um, it takes its time, so it's more of what we would call today a slow burn. A woman's husband is a pilot. They don't have an especially happy marriage, but she doesn't think it's that bad. Um, and then she gets that dreaded phone call. And unfortunately, her husband is the pilot on the plane, not just a passenger. And he is under suspicion that he had something to do with it. So, um, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. And this was in 1999, so pre 9-11. Um, so it's interesting that it provided that story before we had so much more information on 9-11, like terrorism. But the story is really about the main character unraveling who her husband Jack was and the parts of him that she did not know um, when he was alive. It's another one that as the woman is uncovering her husband's secrets, she is forming new relationships. And even though they are formed around this terrible time, they provide um, some happiness within this troubled time. So highly recommend Pilot's Wife um, by Anita Shreve. And then the other one that I added the um, recommend or the review for is Anita Shreve's Sea Glass. This one doesn't stick with me quite as much, but I remember I did enjoy it. I read it after the Pilot's Wife. If I'm not mistaken, my husband's cousin's wife recommended Sea Glass to me. Um, on Goodreads, it says it's the second in the Fortune's Rock series. I'm not really sure how it was a second book. I don't remember feeling like I was picking it up in the middle of the series. 
Um, it's historically set in 1929. I'm not great on historical fiction. Um, they don't usually stick with me quite so much. Um, but it happens during the Great Depression and you can definitely see how that adds to the story of the two main characters, um, Honora and Sexton and their marriage and how the Great Depression is just providing a lot of stress on their marriage. Um, so it's a very thoughtful book. It shows how Shreve just has that skill of telling a character's story and developing that character as they go through some trying times. And I, I just remember enjoying the book, appreciating the book, um, but it is, it is very dark. That's what I remember. I seem to have three more books of Anita Shreve. Let me see if I can locate those. I don't know. I can't put my hands on them, but I still need to add a review for um, Anita Shreve's Stella Bain. I read that one too. I didn't love it and I was having a hard time to re even remembering what it was about, but I'm going to um, add a review for that. And then um, I seem to have her books, All He Ever Wanted, The Weight of Water, and Strange Fits of Passion, but I can't put my hands on them and literally just reorganize the entire shelves. So I don't know. I can't find it. I can't put my hands on it and I feel like I know exactly where it should be and it's not there. But whatever, maybe I'll come across it before we get to the end here. That's quite possible. Right, the next one, again, I really enjoyed it. Um, I gave it five out of five stars. It is Marion Lane and the Midnight Murder by T.A. Wilbur. Um, I saw this one, I'm pretty sure whenever I was looking at one of those book page um, magazine like publications uh, that you pick up in the bookstore or the library and they talk about new books that are coming out. And so I immediately like requested this because it sounded like a book for me and it is five out of five. I listened to it. It's a beautiful audio. You know how I say like the narrator makes it or breaks it. The narrator, uh, t <laughs> the narrator makes it in this one. Like her accent is just beautiful. The delivery of the story, marvelous. Um, the narrator is Karen Cass, if that means anything to you. It's set in 1958 London. I don't have a copy of it, sorry to say, um, but because I just listened to it, but this is what I was talking about. Like it's a more modern book. It just came out, um, hmm, do I have that? In 2020, um, it was 10 hours to listen, but I listened to it while I was cleaning and reorganizing and it was just a beautiful way to listen to it. So you know how like you have those mundane tasks that don't take any thought. Um, that just need to happen. That's when I listen to a lot of books. Um, like when I'm cleaning, organizing, doing the dishes, folding the laundry. I just really enjoy listening to books or podcasts while I'm doing that. So I know that it was pitched as like an Agatha Christie locked um, room murder mystery. And so that's why I'm like starting to gravitate towards those because I now know what that means. Locked room, there's a limited amount of suspects. Um, and so you should be able to figure out what is happening given your limited number of suspects. But of course that never works out that way, but, um, that's how it was pitched. And that's why I listened to it. It is a series. So the next one is going to be Marion Lane and the Deadly Rose. So I will listen to that soon. Um, it came out in February of this year. You do get some historical background because it's taking place in 1950. Where do I see it? 1958. 1958 London. It is a bit more um, fantasy than realistic too though. So there is an agency, they recruit people to work for their, their agency and that's how Marion Lane got involved. Um, she is an orphan, she was being raised by, I believe it's an aunt, I'm pretty sure it's an aunt, not a happy relationship there. Um, and she gets um, handpicked to come and work for this company. It's not really as light as a cozy, so I'm not going to call it a cozy. It's more of a fantasy mystery um, with some historical stuff going on in there, too. Um, it is an audio that I did have to pay a little bit more attention to. Like at the beginning, I thought, hmm, I might have to, you know, stop listening to it and, and order the um, print copy. But then I finished listening to it on audio without going to get the print copy. And I just learned that I needed to be paying more attention. It's not a cozy. You can't like walk in and out of the room like you need every detail. So I would listen to it more like when I was driving rather than cleaning. Miss Brickett's Investigations and Inquiries um, is the company that recruited Marion to work for them as an investigator in training, an inquirer in training, I believe it is. Um, and she gets tangled up in a murder that happens not too long after she is there. She's still in training. 
Unfortunately, one of her dear friends is accused um, of the murder. I don't know if accused is the word, like he's under suspicion, right? So she uh, really wants to figure out what is going on. She's already been in some weird things before this ever takes place, um, and it's just unexplainable. Miss Burgess usually picks up where MI6 leaves off. Um, so if they, um, if MI6 or Scotland Yard has a case and they just kind of let it fall to the wayside or they can't quite get to it, um, that's where Miss Burgess picks up and tries to figure out some of those inquiries. There were places full of like underground tunnels and secret rooms and secret devices. Um, employees who have special skills, you don't always know what their special skill is. But I enjoyed beginning this series, listening to it, getting caught up in this world. It has just the right amount of fantasy for me. So not like full-blown fantasy, not like Harry Potter, Wizards and Wizard, witch, Witches and Wizards, um, but just kind of a dabbling in fantasy. It makes it hard to classify it as whether it's like fantasy or mystery. So I'm going to say it's kind of a fantasy mystery, but it's light fantasy, more mystery. Uh, really enjoyed it. Gave it a 5 out of 5. Highly recommend it. The audio is superb. The next one I don't have a copy of either, so I'm going to put Agatha up here for you to look at uh, while I'm talking about it, but it's called All the Missing Girls. It's by Megan Miranda. Um, I went to go see my uh, son and his girlfriend, and she was um, reading a Megan Miranda book and uh, just had a cover. I don't know if you can see the cover there, but had a cover that I thought was kind of cool. Um, but she was uh, reading a different Megan Miranda. So I re um, requested this one. It's called All the Missing Girls. I listened to it in audio. I enjoyed it. I gave it a four out of five. Um, and I gave it probably a four out of five just because I started losing interest toward the end. Like, um, there are two missing girls. They're separated by about a decade apart, I think. And through the unraveling of the mystery, I just felt like, okay, get on with it. Like, come on. Um, and then the ending was not the best ending for me. Um, but again, you know, author's choice. You can end a book however you want to. But um, just not, the, not my favorite ending, I think. Uh, but it's definitely a thriller in the vein of Gone Girl and Girl on the Train. And that's what I was looking for was a good thriller. And again, for an audio uh, while I was working around the house, perfect. You know, unreliable narrator is a big thing. Obviously, if I mention Gone Girl and Girl on the Train, you know, unreliable narrator is going to be part of that theme. Um, but it's not, it's not an unreliable narrator that you're surprised by. Like whenever you meet the main character, you can tell she's a bit unstable, um, that there's some stuff going on. You don't really have the full story, but you just know you might not be able to, she can't trust herself. So you probably can't trust her a whole lot either, but it's not, it's not like startling, um, unreliable narrator, but definitely unreliable narrator. There's a balance between what the author is revealing through the narrator and what you're learning from the outside. It really helps unravel this mystery um, of the past 10 years. So like I said, two missing girls about a dec decade apart. I started noticing the trope of the girl who's with the wrong guy when I was reading this. I'm like, that's got to be a trope because I feel like it comes up over and over and over again that there's a girl, she's with the wrong guy, the love of her life comes into the story. That's definitely a trope, right? It's in this book. I don't really remember seeing that trope so much in a thriller before, so that was interesting. I enjoyed the twists and turns in this one. The timeline might be a bit polarizing to readers though. Um, so when I'm recommending books in the classroom or when I'm talking to kids about um, books that they're reading, this comes up a lot that they either like or don't like when the point of view changes or when you're going back and forth in time. Um, this one starts out and then it goes back and then it moves forward to the present crime. So um, the timeline's a bit uh, complicated. It's kind of a reversal of a story but it works. It totally works for this thriller and how you're going to unfold the story. Um, I did realize when I was reading Gone Girl, it was a realization when I actually went to go listen to the author speak. She uh, talked about the fact that if you don't like your characters, if you're someone who you need to like the character, then she's not your writer. And that was Jillian Flynn. Um, and after she said it, I'm like, that's me. Like a lot of these books that everybody loves and I don't like, it's because their characters are just not redeeming people. Like I don't, 
sympathize with them. I don't like them. But ever since I went to that talk where she said that, I'm okay with it. Now that I recognize that that was my problem, as long as I'm like, oh, I'm not really going to identify with this character. I'm not really going to like this character. I'm not going to have sympathy for this character. I am able to enjoy the story just for the story. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Jillian Flynn. I will definitely read and listen to more Megan Miranda. It was a good story. So uh, the next book that I'm going to talk to you about is another Agatha Christie. It is The Seven Dials. What The Seven Dials Mystery by Agatha Christie. Um, the copy that I have is that uh, you know like faux leather edition, which I didn't think I was going to really like, and then I do really like this. So that's a lot with the Agatha Christie's this which book, which like edition that I have. Um, and I really like to have these in print and I do normally listen to them on audio and then watch the TV adaptations too. But I really want to have these in print because I want to annotate them. Um, and I'm trying to track certain things in Agatha Christie. So I need to annotate. Again, not gonna go in as deep on this one as I normally do with my book group, but um, I do wanna talk to you about it and recommend it to you. So the next book that I'm going to talk to you about is Agatha Christie's The Seven Dials Mystery. And we are 10 novels into the chronological reading of Agatha Christie, and this is my favorite. So I loved um, Murder of Roger Ackroyd. I loved The Mysterious Affair at Styles, um, And now this one is moving above those and is number one in my ranking of the first 10 stories read chronologically by Agatha Christie. It's a companion to The Secret of Chimneys, so I was pleasantly surprised because I didn't love The Secret of Chimneys. I remember thinking in that one that it's called a Superintendent Battle book, like the first one in the Superintendent Battle series within the Agatha Christie's, and like you barely even read him. Like he's in it, but he's not, he's, he's no Perot, right? Um, so I just, I didn't expect for this one to be quite so enjoyable and for me to get to know him a little bit more, and I really like him too. Um, so this is number two of five in that series. It's way more revealing of him, like his personality comes out. Um, he's a little more tongue in cheek. He's funny, but not because he's making jokes funny. He's very witty, um, and it's just fun. His humor is very fun. I only wish that we could see more of Bundle and um, Lord Catterham that are, um, like both of them were in Secret of Chimneys. They're in this one. They're more of a character in this one. Bundle is definitely more of a character in this one. But then that's it. I wish Christy would bring them back. I really enjoyed them. They are quite the pair. It's, um, you know, the daughter and the father and he's like this elderly gentleman. Um, I just, I love them both. She's a very liberated woman. Um, in true Agatha fashion, um, I did not beat Agatha to the punch on this one. I was pleasantly surprised when we find out who done it. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and I highly recommend The Mystery of the Seven Dials. Let me see if I can find some good lines for you. Again, I will go into these way more in depth when I do the Agatha Christie video. I like that Agatha makes a lot of references to like authors or mystery novels um, or thrillers within her books. She kind of is very tongue in cheek about it. Um, it's written in a time when like uh, people would stay at these manors with people that they didn't really know. I don't know how that would come about, but like there's this group of people in this this house, um, uh, a locked a locked room mystery again from Agatha Christie. But um, Jimmy is one of the main characters, and he is talking to his friend Rupert Bateman, who is also known as Pongo. Um, and he says, morning, Pongo, said Jimmy. I suppose I shall have to go and make myself agreeable to those blasted girls. Are you coming? Because there's a whole group of young people that are staying with um, the two people who are actually renting the house for a number of, um, I think, want to say two years, maybe. But the mystery of the seven dials is actually the seven clocks that they buy, like alarm clocks to... Um, um, like pull a prank on one of the guys that's staying there that seems to sleep in too long. That's where the seven dials comes from. But then there's some weird stuff that happens and it ends up meaning more than just the seven dials that are in the locked room with the guy who was murdered. Um, we have poison in this as usual. A lot of characters as usual. A reference to the mafia. And then a lot of those little uh, clues, like Superintendent Battle saying that nobody tells everything. <laughs> this is what I mean by Bundle and her dad. They're talking. Her dad tells her, tomorrow, 12 o'clock, Melrose will call for you. Having found the body, 
you'll have to get evidence, but he said that you needn't be alarmed. Well, why on earth should I be alarmed? This is Bundle. Well, you know, said Lord Catterham apologetically, Melrose is a bit old fashioned. 12 o'clock, said Bundle. Good. I shall be here if I'm still alive. Have you any reason to anticipate not being alive? Well, one never knows, says Bundle. The strain of modern life, as the newspapers say. <laughs> it's just fun. Um, their banter back and forth is super fun. Um, the relationships that build throughout the story, it's just very, very Agatha. Uh, I really enjoyed the unraveling of the story. And I think you will too. I swear, I don't have a lot of flies in the house, but for some reason right now, they are all in this one room with us. And then the last book that I would talk to you about is another Agatha Christie, but I'm not going to talk about it too much either. Um, but we are discussing it a week from this Friday. It's Partners in Crime. Um, it's the second Tommy and Tuppence. Uh, and I've not yet put the Goodreads review out there. I'll try and do that tonight or tomorrow. Um, but super enjoyed that one too. Although I'll be honest, I did not enjoy it um, as much as most of the others because it's a short story collection. I think this is our second short story collection. We read um, Perot Investigates, maybe it was our first short story collection. And I usually like short stories, but maybe not so much with Agatha Christie. I just don't feel like she gets into the story enough. This one is a little more um, jointed than the Perot Investigates. Perot Investigates, it was really like these little bitty stories that he was putting together, um, kind of Sherlock Holmes style. Um, where he's just telling you about it, a little case like he would put in the newspaper, kind of like that. Whereas this one was Tommy and Tuppence. They are working again together um, undercover. Uh, and it's the cases that they take on in this little detective agency that they have. Um, and I will have to say that I enjoyed it more after I read the Wikipedia um, article that was about the short story collection. It just kind of laid it out for me a little bit more and um, help me understand that it was a collection of parodies. So each one of these stories that Agatha is telling you is a parody of another famous um, detective story or character and that Tommy and Tuppence were just kind of playing those out like they were parodying, parodying them, right? So like Father Brown, Sherlock obviously, and then a lot of people that I don't know or haven't heard of. Um, and the Wikipedia article like makes a lot more sense of that for me. Um, uh, it's another one that I did not have a copy of. So I think because I didn't have a copy of it and I'm just listening to it, it's harder for me to come up with like great lines, but a lot of the same themes that are coming up in Agatha Christie are there, like never trust the help, um, lots of disguises, masks, kidnappings. Um, I still have not fallen in love with Tommy and Tuppence. They're okay. Um, but yeah, like the first story, especially the pink, what's it called? Um, a pot of tea, the fairy in the flat, like introduces it. And then it's a, a pot of tea, not the pink pearl, a pot of tea. Um, it's just unethical. Like Tuppence sets up someone to come to them for help. And it's all to get someone like a proposal of marriage. And no, I'm not okay with that. Like I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't love them. <laughs> um, but they're, they, it's a good, it's a good collection. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it more after I kind of put together that they are parodying stories that I don't necessarily know. I do watch Father Brown, but I've never read any of the stories. Um, again, I've watched Sherlock. I've never read any of the stories, but I see what she's trying to do here. Okay, Agatha, I got it. Um, and I did appreciate it. So I've not put out the good reads for this either, but I promise I've been working on it. I just need to get to it. But it is a small child's book of cozy poems. It's illustrated by Cindy Shikres, <laughs> S-Z-E-K-E-R-E-S. -E -E so however that is. Um, but I wanted to share that one with you, mainly because I was looking up this poem. It's called April Rain Song by Langston Hughes. And then of course, once I find the one poem, then I went ahead and just read the whole book. I may have read it before, I don't know. Um, some of the poems are by very well-known authors, and then some are just anonymous spring poems. Um, but it's one, it's a book that I bought for my son when he was young. It says March of 99, so I probably put it in his Easter basket, let's be honest. Um, but um, Langston Hughes, Jeff Perlutsky, so if you are in children's literature at all, you know he writes a lot of poetry for children, does a lot of collections for children. Uh, Christina Rossetti, Margaret Wise Brown, 
and Jane Yolen. So some people that you would recognize there if you're in children's literature at all, but I enjoyed it. It's a good one. If you are looking for a small introductory book of poetry for your child, this is a good one and you could read it together. Um, so I will put a Goodreads review out there on that one and add it to our shelf too. So like I said, I do teach high school English. I teach all freshmen and then um, a class of general senior English. And in doing that this year, after testing in the spring, which is horrific, um, and then before the end of the year is a really weird time um, where you're trying to finish up all the things you've done all year, revisit things that you think they might need a review for, um, and then also have a little bit of fun because you feel like it's like a mad dash to get through testing. And then once testing's done, like the pressure is off a little bit. So this year, um, it's become more and more apparent to me, being back in the classroom for the last two years, um, you get a feel for all of the kids, not just the kids that choose to come to the library and connect with you. Um, but you get a little bit more of a feel of the average student. Um, and I think I realized that the average student today in our particular community um, does not have a very traditional upbringing. upbringing. Um, no one has read to them. They don't have a lot of exposure to some of those children's stories. Um, and I just kind of wanted to work with that a little bit. So I told the kids uh, that we were going to have like a little brainstorming session and I wanted them to tell me all of those children's books that they remember either reading or being read to either in school or at home. Um, and we brainstormed a bunch of those onto the board. Um, and then I also had some that I really wanted to share with them. And then we just took a day and I shared those books with them. Um, I read to them, they relaxed and it was, it was a great day. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to share with you some of the titles that I shared with them. Um, I'm not really going to book talk these. I'm just going to show you these titles and then I will put some reviews out there. And then again, maybe I'll do a separate video and book talk some of those picture books with you. I said some of these they came up with some, I just wanted to share with them. So we have Chicka Chicka Boom Boom by Bill Martin Jr. and John Archambald. <laughs> that was a popular one. Um, and then obviously I couldn't read all of these to every class. Like I have six different classes. So I showed them what I had and then had them tell me like, which ones do you want me to start with? And then I would just read whichever ones they um, wanted. No David was a popular one by David Shannon. Um, and all of these are the books that I already had at home, like when my kid was growing up in, um, you know, that the 2000s, basically. Curious George um, by H.R. Ray. This is a popular one with my son, so we have several in the series. Curious George gets a medal. Curious George takes a job. Curious George rides a bike. Uh, Good Night Moon, almost every class wanted to hear that one by Margaret Wise Brown, who I just mentioned to you in the Book of Cozies. Click Clack Moo was very popular, Cows That Type by Doreen Corrin, and then also by Doreen Corrin, Duck for President, and Giggle Giggle Quack. <laughs> um, Llama Llama Red Pajama was actually a donated one for my classroom, so I'll take this one back to the class, but that was a cute one, and a lot of them knew that one. Now, obviously, they're a little younger than my son by four or five six, seven, eight, nine-ish years. So um, their exposure to some of these that they knew I didn't know. Corduroy by Don Freeman. If you take a mouse to the movies by Laura Numeroff. The Very Hungry Caterpillar was a super popular one by Eric Carley. The Giving Tree, which is not my favorite, and I know, go ahead and throw out the hate there, but I don't, I don't love The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Dr. Seuss, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, Where the Wild Things Are by uh, Marie Sendick, and Clifford the Big Red Dog by um, Norman Bridwell. So that's my stack of the picture books that I share with my class, and I'll be putting some reviews out there for you on Goodreads, um, and maybe I'll do a breakout book where I recommend them a little bit more. There's a couple more on here. I don't know why I don't have them sitting over here, but... I think I might have already talked to you about um, Anderson's Fairy Tales, The Ugly Duckling, because I shared that one with them at one point too. Um, I also read Hawthorne's The Golden Touch to them at one point this year, um, and Androcles and the Lion, which is an Aesop's fable, um, and Black Beauty. I read them an excerpt of that too. Um, the picture book 
a bad case of the stripes by David Shannon of the No David book that I talked to you about. Um, so I think somebody might have brought that copy in for us and we read that. They really liked that. Yeah, so that pretty much sums that up for us. All right, so there's a couple more on my list that um, this kind of under that review section that I feel like I had talked to you about, but whenever I was cleaning up my bookshelves, I also cleaned up my document that talked about like my bookshelves that said like, these are the ones I've shared with you. These are the ones I've mentioned. And for some reason, these weren't on there and they're books that I um, feel like I should have talked to you about because I have shown you the books that I pick up um, and try and you know make it through every year or the books that I have been trying to read like like I've been reading them for a long time and I'm just, you know, trying to make it through them. And for some reason they weren't on there, but I did just talk to you about um, the children's classics, Anderson's fairy tales. Um, when I was telling you that I read some of these to my class, the ugly duckling for one. Um, but for some reason, I don't think I actually ever showed you that book. So I'm gonna show you that one. Um, this is probably part of a set but you can see it's under my maiden name there. And it says 1991, so I've picked it up somewhere. I don't know where, but um, I would like to at some point read all of these fairy tales um, because I've heard of them. I'm familiar with them, but I've not actually read them. But this looks like it was copyright um, 1961. And then this is one of those reference books that's over there on my shelf of currently reading. It's Blockbuster's all-time favorites, movies and music. Um, and you know, as much as I read, I also love to watch movies and TV shows. And this has it um, separated by genre. So there's like dramas, comedies, action. And I just like every once in a while flipping through here and being like, oh yeah, there's a movie that I, I've heard a lot about and I've not actually ever read, or I've heard a lot about it, but I've not actually uh, watched it and I would like to. So this is on my currently reading shelf over there. This is on my currently reading shelf over there. I've, I don't know, been reading it for a long time. It's one that I pick up, flip through a little bit and then sit back down and I need to just finish it. But it's 1001 Ways to Be Romantic by Gregory Godek. Um, and it's just a book of lists. So with that, I mean, that's my problem is it's not like a pick up and finish it kind of book, um, but it's on that shelf over there of books that I'm trying to finish. Um, I know I've talked to you about this, so I don't know why it wasn't on that list, but it's Agatha Christie's Companion, The Complete Guide to Agatha Christie's Life and Work. Um, and I've been making my way through this as a reference book while I'm leading the Agatha Christie group. So it has a little bit about our background and then it goes into each of the stories and gives you more background, like what was happening during her life during that time, um, the adaptations for that particular one or the themes that run through. I really, really, am loving this um, and it's hefty but of course it's one of those that i pick up so after i finish reading the book i pick up the reference book i go to that chapter read take some notes share those with the group um, and then these two are on my short stack over there because i think i might use them in class and it's types of great literature um, by houston and Bennell. and um, again i know it's super old uh, this one is copyright 1919 but i like that it shows me the different kinds of literature that I'm trying to share with them. So like epic and romance, narrative poetry, ballads, lyric poetry, letters, orations, biographies, essays, and it's a collection of some of those classics. So I like to have a good balance of, um, you know, like picture books and then super hard classics that they can never read on their own or um, uh, classics and then very modern, fun, like I Hunt Killers uh, reading. Um, so trying to find that balance and I'm just using that as kind of a reference point so I have like a stack of reference books that I'm going through. Another one is The World's Great Letters. Again, I feel like I talked to you about these but they weren't on the list so I like to be thorough. Um, and this has some great letters from famous people that are published. Um, Leonardo da Vinci asked the Duke of Milan for a job, a letter that he wrote. George Washington answers his critics in Congress and from a cold, bleak hill at Valley Forge defends his naked and distressed troops. There's some love letters that are in here, the love letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson greets Walt Whitman at the beginning of a great career. I just thought these would make some um, interesting like introduction into some letters uh, in letter writing. Um, and we did not do a great job of that these last two years. So that's something that I want to incorporate into my classroom. So I'm putting that on the reference shelf. 
All right, so these next ones, I don't know, it's like when I was reorganizing my shelf and I was putting the books of the month up here on top. I think I'm one more ahead of that. Yeah, so you can't actually see them. They're actually right here, I think. Um, there were some that weren't on the list and I don't know why. So these are on my to be read list. Um, the Perfect Mother by Amy Malloy. And I love these book of the month editions where they have this little thing here. So I'm always on alert at um, thrift stores for that. The Unraveling of Cassidy Holmes by Alyssa Sloan. Emma in the Night by Wendy Walker. And November Road by Lou Burney. Um, so all of those I've had, and I probably have talked to you about them and somehow they just missed the list, but they're on my to be read list for the Book of the Month Club. All right, and this is kind of funny because I'm just now realizing it. But the reason that I saw these is because this Alyssa Sloan, I thought was the same author as Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore, but that's Robin Sloan. <laughs> so I went and reviewed Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore because I picked it up at thrift somewhere. Um, and I loved this book. And then I realized just now, those are two different Sloans, but that's okay. At least we got that cleaned up. So these are on my to be read list for the book of the month. And then, like I said, they're just so pretty on a shelf. Look how pretty those are. <laughs> um, wait a minute, what happened here? There we go, very pretty. So that being said, what I wanted to talk to you about is Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore by Robin, Robin Sloan. Um, I picked it up in a recent book haul and then I just remembered how much I loved it. If I'm not mistaken, I have two copies. I have one for the classroom and one for home. Pretty sure. I'm sure because one's a paperback copy and that went to the classroom and then this is the hardback copy and it's going on my shelves. So this is one of those marketing books too where it actually glows in the dark. The cover glows in the dark, 24 hour bookstore, get it. Um, and I took it into my bathroom, which is an internal room here. And um, there's squirrels playing on the back porch and uh, check just to make sure because I had heard that before and it's true uh, it does glow in the dark which you know what those gimmicky things they're gimmicks for a reason it <laughs> I love them um, and this is a really pretty book I also like this it's got the Robin Sloan I don't know if you can see that yeah I think you can right there um, a little like imprint on the front of the actual book which is cool so I read this back in 2014 and I still smile when I think about it it's that kind of book um, it's a book for book lovers, for readers, like it's a bookstore. It's a guy that works in a bookstore. Clay Johnson is the main character and uh, he's been downsized during the recession. When was this written? It was published in 2012. I read it in 2014. Um, I always like that at Verso page too for you where it has like uh, the subjects and it says bookstores, employees, fiction, bookstores, California, San Francisco fiction. Um, and it doesn't say fantasy and there's a bit of a fantasy going on in there. So it's a little weird, but Clay has been downsized from his company during the recession. So he's looking for a different job. He ends up working in Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore, but he's not working there very long before he realizes this is not your average bookstore. He's not just peddling books to people. Um, it's the people that come in are very unusual. They're looking for very unusual books. They do have them but they're obscure titles. So he's convinced there's something more going on than meets the eye. And he is going to enlist the help of some of his friends and find out what is happening. It sounds like what every reader dreams of, like, please let me find a job in a bookstore or a library. I had that dream job for a lot of years um, and I hope to get back to it someday. But in this particular bookstore, people are not coming in and just asking for modern fiction and buying those titles. They come in and they ask for obscure titles and they borrow them. So they're on a quest to crack the code and what exactly is going on here. They all end up in an adventure. This is more a discord on like books and life uh, and people who just are looking for the answer to a question or the trying to figure out a puzzle. Clay obviously finds a story that is much more interesting than just working in a regular old bookstore. Uh, he finds out that what is contained in these books between the covers has a deeper meaning than just telling a novel, like just telling a story. This was Sloan's debut, obviously not the same Sloan as Book of the Month, hello. 
But I would say this is part puzzle mystery, part romance, part fairy tale, but it's really just a fun literary adventure and I highly recommend it. Mr. Panumer's 24 hour bookstore by Robin Sloan. I know I, I would still give it probably a four out of five um, because you know, it's not like super in the front of my mind, but when I see the cover, I have, like I said, I just smile because I'm like, oh, I remember that book. That was fun, right? All right, <laughs> you know how like something gets in your head? I do this, I did this yesterday when I was reorganizing my craft room. I knew the day before I had just seen um, little tabs that I had pre-made. And I knew, I just saw them, like I organized them. I like to put like things together and then file them away. Couldn't find them, just could not put my hands on them. And it was at least an hour. And then of course, it all of a sudden hits me where I put it, went there, right there. Here are those Anita Shreves that I literally just spent probably, in, I don't know, not an hour, but half hour um, looking, because I thought maybe they were here or maybe they were over here. Like I went and got the ladder, like, God, it's gotta be right here. I got right here, it says I own them. Here they are. All we ever wanted, the weight of water, strange fits of passion. Uh, so those are on my to be read list from Anita Shreve. And now I've shown you the cover. So, so the next uh, couple of books that I wanted to talk to you about are by Janet Ivanovich. I, uh, when I was reshelling, like I saw so many of these and I was like, oh, these would be fun to review and put out there for the summer. Um, so I'm going to add, or I did add some good read for reviews to these. And then I have a stack of to be read. So I'm going to show you those covers and then put them in their rightful place on the shelves. So Janet Ivanovich is definitely an author that I want to get back to. Um, I've read a number of hers. Most of them I've probably done on audio because they really lend themselves to that. Um, they're just fun mystery. I wouldn't call them cozy mysteries, um, but they're fun mysteries. Hmm. What I call them cozy mysteries? I might call them cozy mysteries. Um, because they do take place and, uh, you know, like maybe I need a checklist for it. It's a cozy if, um, it takes place in a small group of friends or family. They're not particularly violent. Hmm, shouldn't say violent. They're not particularly graphic murders. Like you usually walk up into the murder after it's already happened. Um, usually has a bit of a love story. So yeah, okay. I'm going to make them cozy. We're going to call it cozy and we're going to shovel them with the cozies. Um, the first one that I want to talk to you about is called Metro Girl. Looks like I read that back in 2004. I did do the audio. I marked it on that. Um, and nope, I did have to add the review for this. So I did not have a good reads review out there for it. This is called the Alex Barnaby number one. Um, the next one is called Motor Mouth. And I really thought I had a copy. I do. I have a copy of Motor Mouth. <laughs> uh, so I say what oh i need to do a youtube put it with the cozies to be read uh, motor mouth is number two after metro girl so that's the next one in the series but metro girl was fun um the only thing that maybe might throw it out of the cozy universe and i think we had a chit chat about this on last week's killing time with cozies is it does have quite a bit of language as i recall um, but again, appropriate language for the characters, the situation and the times, I don't feel like it's overdone and not so much that it turned me off. Not that I'm turned off by a lot of language, but I'm not someone who uses a lot of language. I'm not around it that much. I work in education. Um, but, uh, I would say that it was, it's, it's a fun read. That's what I remember is that they're fun reads. So if there's language in there, it's, it can't be that much. It takes place in South Beach, Miami, Cuba. Um, the main character... Alex goes back and forth um, and she meets up with a guy, Sam Hooker, I think his name is. He's a NASCAR driver. Um, it's just a really, really fun um, story. Just unraveling of a cute story. And again, great audio and summer. So I'm going to put that on my to be read, read list uh, for next summer. Let's go ahead and get that started, even though we haven't finished summer this year. <laughs> so the next one that I would talk to you about with Janet Ivanovich would be one for the money. It's the first in her Stephanie Plum series. It also is a movie which I tried to get on um, uh, my, my, what do you call it, platforms and none of my platforms offer it, unfortunately. I had to switch over to a Pepsi because it looks like I've been recording for three and a half hours. I know it won't end up being that after I edit, but you know, I have to edit out that half hour of looking for the um, Anita Shree books and that sort of thing, letting the dog in and out 500 times. I needed a cold drink. So it wasn't available on any of my platforms, but I have already seen the movie and I read the book. I just kind of wanted to refresh my memory. 
Um, but I remember I really enjoyed it. I don't know if I read this one in print or audio. That part doesn't stick out to me. And when I say like cozy, they also have some humor in them, which I think maybe that goes on the checklist of cozies. Should I make a list on the checklist of cozy things is it probably has to have humor in it. I don't know that I read any cozies that aren't humorous. Uh, but there's definitely a main character that has a tight um, knit group of a community of some sort. Um, in this particular one, it's her family, <coughs> kind of her family, uh, who ends up being some of the people that she works with. But you meet her friends, her family, her support group, basically. There is definitely a chase and a mystery going on. Okay, and so maybe New Jersey, where this takes place, modern day New Jersey, is not a super cozy, <laughs> uh, hallmarky kind of little town, but it really works for this particular series. Uh, and it starts off with Stephanie Plum, the main character, um, being, do I not have a copy of one for the money? I don't think I do. So there's this. Um, but she, she's not in this, so it's only this author. We'll do this one because I know she's in that. Um, but Stephanie Plum is in a tight spot. She has lost her job. She has bills. She's single. She's floundering. So she just happens to have a cousin who has a um, like bounty kind of business and she offers to do some work for him. So he throws an apprehension job along her way. We'll call it an apprehension job. But unfortunately, the first guy that she is sent to find, she has a bit of a history with. Um, he was her first and did not treat her well. He was just a fly-by-night kind of guy. So she might be holding a bit of a grudge against uh, Joe Morelli, but it ends up working out for her. She ends up really liking the um, bounty hunting career. She decides to continue doing that. But it was more of a um, competition than she thought. She didn't realize that they would be like racing against not only time, but other people to try and bring these people in. So she makes a new friend. His name is Ranger. And together they go trying to find some of these um, uh, people that have a bounty on their head. It's a very fun, um, Ivanovich we weaves a masterful adventure for you. Very humorous. I love the blue collar feel of the whole thing. There are 29 primary works in this and then a couple of um, what they call between the numbers novels that I'm gonna also talk to you about. I definitely need to get back to this series. I also read Visions of Sugar Plums. Looks like I don't have a copy of that one, but I did put a review out there for you. It's classified as an 8.5, so a between the numbers. So each of her titles have like one for the money, two for the show, or sorry, two for the dough, three to get deadly, that sort of thing going on. So this is a between the numbers one. Um, but I remember reading it again. It's um, a holiday theme, and I'm a sucker for a holiday theme, especially a holiday theme cozy, which we are going to say these are. So Stephanie, eight books in, is definitely slaying the, um, the bounty hunting business, but she's not doing so great at the holidays. She doesn't have her decorations up. Um, she's not really enjoying the hol holiday festivities. Um, they're all around her, but she just doesn't have time because she is doing such a good job in the business. Um, and I love that this one introduces us to Diesel, who is a reoccurring character, and again, in some of the other ones that I read, and just super fun character. Steams it up a little bit. Uh, we also get more of Grandma Mazer and her sister, uh, I'm sorry, and Stephanie's sister Valerie in this one. Super fun ride. Highly recommend. Uh, that's Vision of Sugar Plums. And yeah, I read One for the Money, and I read Sugar Plums, and I read Metro Girl. Um, Metro Girl is a different series, but you don't necessarily have to read the series in order, but I would definitely recommend it. I need to go back and do it, um, but because of that, it was a holiday novel, I picked it up during the holidays, obviously. And then the last one that I could talk to you about is Plum Spooky. Uh, again, holiday themed cozy, so I read it out of order. This is technically classified as 14.5. I hope you keep a list of like um, your reading calendar and what you want to read when because I do a lot of those where I'm like this is a perfect autumn read or you need to read this at Christmas or you should read this one you know whatever so I hope you keep a list of those um, maybe that's something that I could probably create for you <laughs> I love lists um, but I will maybe create that for you so you've got something that you're like oh it's Halloween I know didn't she tell me there was a book that I should read yes I did it's called Plum Spooky by Janet Ivanovich <laughs> Our favorite characters are in this one too, Stephanie, Grandma Mazer, Diesel, and Lizzie. Um, and they unite to chase Martin Munch, 
Uh, there are also some new characters that are in this one and some monkeys, as I recall. Uh, but it's a nice addition to the Plum Spooky or to the Plum World uh, with Plum Spooky. So again, fun seasonal read. Highly recommend Plum Spooky by Janet Ivanovich. So now to the ones that are getting added to my to be read list, um, and that would be Plum Lovin'. Let's see if I put a number there. That's a 12.5. Plum Lucky. That's a 13.5. Probably going to need to read that around St. Patrick's Day. Um, this one, which is a collaboration between uh, Janet Yovanovitch and Dorian Kelly called Love in a Nutshell. Uh, Wicked Business, which Halloween, obviously, right? Um, this is a Lizzie and Diesel novel. And then, like I said, the first one is one for the money. Then we have two for the dough, three to get deadly, four to score, high five, hot six, seven up, hard eight, and Lean Mean 13. Now, there's a high possibility that I borrowed these from my friends Lynn and Jill. <laughs> I can't remember if they're mine or if they're theirs, so I'm gonna have to ask them, and if so, I'm gonna have to get a move on this and put these in my borrow pile. But I'm not quite sure, but they will be here for my book club in about a week and a half, and I will ask them before I put them on my shelf, because I never add to my shelf books that I borrowed so that we don't end up with this kind of debacle where I'm borrowing books for a lifetime. I do not mean to do that. If I've done that, I apologize, and please bring that to my attention. <laughs> now, I think these hardback ones are definitely mine, but I've got this one, To the Nines, Fearless 14, and 12 Sharp. These are books that you can easily pick up at the thrift store, and I'm sure that's what I've done with these three. They're not marked anywhere. Oh, this one looks like I picked up at a consignment store in Columbus called One More Time. Um, so I might have gotten the rest of these there too. I don't see any other markings on them, but I'm sure the hardback ones are mine, but I think these paperbacks might actually be my friends, um, Lynn and Jill. Highly recommend Janet Ivanovich, especially the Stephanie Plum series and the holiday cozies, um, but her other series like Metro Girl, Motor Mouth, love those two. So the next two books I wanted to talk to you about, one I read, um, and I don't have a copy of it, but it's called Hook, Line, and, sorry, <laughs> it's called Hook, Line, and Murder. Um, it says it's by Jessica Fletcher, who is a fictional character, please don't do that, um, David Bain and Renee Polly Bain. I reviewed this back in 2018. Um, I am a big Murder, She Wrote mystery fan. Um, I have watched every episode, even after I like dabbled in it here and there, I went back and watched them from the beginning and watched all seasons. There's like a gajillion of them. And then um, I realized that there was actually a book series based off of the Murder, She Wrote series. And they say they are penned by Jessica Fletcher. She is on the cover of the books. Uh, but these are two that I have not yet read. Um, this one is Panning for Murder. And this one is Jen and Daggers. So I don't know if the titles match up with particular episodes because her episodes are named. Um, but the only one that I've read is Hook, Line, and Murder, which I have not, I don't have a copy of. Um, I think I probably read the ebook copy. I'm pretty sure that's how I did that. Yep, I actually have it in my notes that uh, back in 2018, I borrowed it from the public library on an ebook site um, and I read it on my Kindle. It reads very much like the show, so if you like the show, then you're going to like the books. If you think it's too corny in the show, you're going to think the books are too corny. It's the same town, the same characters. Um, it's the same kind of murder and mayhem, and I just really super enjoyed Hook, Line, and Murder, and I look forward to reading these two, The Gin and Daggers and The Panning for Murder. And I feel like at some point I probably picked these up and showed them to you, but they weren't on my list, so I wanted to make sure that I've actually shown you the covers. To be read, pile. And then these next two... Um, I have one that I read, The Spellman Files, and then I have Revenge of the Spellmans that I've just not read yet. Is this number two? No, this is number three, so there's a number two that I'll have to get in between. But for some reason, like when I was doing Stephanie Plum and The Murder She Wrote, um, I'm like, huh, I don't think I've ever talked to them about The Spellman Files. And um, so I added a review for that one. I try and throw out there a review a day. I'm terrible at it, but that's what I would like to do. It's the goal. Um, so let me talk to you a minute about the Spellmans. I'm gonna shell these with Cozy Mysteries. 
but it's not really a traditional mystery, kind of in the same idea as like Ivanovich is not quite a cozy mystery. Um, but it has a lot of humor and suspense, um, a, a community of people, but not like a town community. It's more like people that know each other. So I really think that works as a cozy. There's a lot of humor in it um, and no like graphically violent crime that you're like watching. I did whenever I was um, going back to review this and, um, you know, looking for some information, I did see that it was optioned for a movie. I ended up falling down that rabbit hole and watching several like YouTube trailers and interviews with the author and fell in love with the book all over again. I gave it a four out of five. And this is one that I would consider going back and listening like to the audio for the first one and then continuing the series because I remember it being that fun. I really liked the uh, what it says on the flap here. Meet Isabel Izzy Spellman, private investigator. This 28-year-old may have a checkered past littered with romantic mistakes, excessive drinking, and creative vandalism. That's an interesting way to put it. She may be addicted to the Get Smart reruns and prefer entering homes through windows rather than doors, but the upshot is that she is good at her job as a licensed private investigator um, with her family's firm, Spellman Investigations. Invading people's privacy comes naturally to Izzy. In fact, it comes naturally to all the Spellmans. If only they could leave their work at the office. To be a Spellman is to snoop on a Spellman, tail a Spellman, dig up dirt on, blackmail, and wiretap a Spellman. So uh, family business, the family business is private investigations. Very funny, highly recommend. I feel like that flap says it better than I can. The author's acknowledgments in the back, also very funny. Lisa Lutz attended UC Santa Cruz, UC, UC Irvine, the University of Leeds in England and San Francisco State University, although she does not actually have a bachelor's degree. She spent most of the 1990s hopping through a string of low paying odd jobs while writing and rewriting the screenplay Plan B, a mob comedy. Didn't know that was a genre. After the film was made in 2000, she vowed she would never write another screenplay. Though she's not on the lam, Lisa has not had a permanent residence in over two years, but she's calling Seattle home for now. So that's a good, um, you know, little bio thing on the back. I said acknowledgements, it's really a bio. Um, the acknowledgements is also funny, I forgot about that. I did go back and review those too, because she talks to you and then they're all footnoted and the footnotes are all very humorous. 0% loans only can be, men can be mentioned has lent a lot of money in read perhaps more than anyone, including my super crappy early screenplays. <laughs> Morgan's husband and therefore money lending applies to him as well. I mean, just, they're just fun. She's funny. Um, but then she's got like footnote number 18, except my coffee, I'm not acknowledging him. Seriously, this book is not about you. <laughs> it's just super fun. Her humor really comes through. I highly recommend the Spellman series. Um, this is the first one in the series. The first one is called Spellman Files. I don't know what number two is called, but this is the third one, Revenge of the Spellman. So I have that. I should just go back, listen to this, listen to number two, and then read number three. It's easy to, to tell you, like, read alikes with this one. Um, so obviously, Jessica Fletcher, Harriet the Spy, um, Get Smart, Dirty Harry, a little bit Dirty Harry, Nancy Drewish. Um, so highly recommend this series. It's fun. So I made a note and um, I'm pretty sure, I should have looked a little better, but I'm pretty sure I've talked to you about the author, Frank E. Peretti. This Present Darkness, Piercing the Darkness, this is a series. And then another one of his books called The Oath, which I was not a big fan of. But I think I reviewed all these for you, like probably pretty early on in my um, YouTube, booktube adventures. But this week, one of the, I have an app that's like, gives you the verse of the day. I think it's the Bible app. I'm, pretty sure that's the name of it, but it gives you like a Bible verse a day and the Bible verse this week, one of the um, days this week was this present darkness. I just wanted to show that one to you. It's Ephesians 6, 12. I'm pretty sure I've also recommended this particular Bible before too. I really like it um, because it has all this room in the margins. Pretty sure I've already told you that. Do you say the books of the Bible in your head when you're trying to find one too? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. <laughs> you do that. First and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. This is Ephesians 6, 12. This is Ephesians 6, 12. And I just always love when I stumble across those like um, 
book titles and where they come from. So when this one came up, I'm like, oh gosh, I forgot. And I do really, really recommend this series. Um, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the super, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And that sums up what this book is about. It is about spiritual warfare. Pretty sure I've talked to you about this before. Highly recommend. It is like, God, was it written in the 80s? Well, look, again, my maiden name in there, and it says December 25th of 1989. Yep, so I must have gotten these for Christmas, um, but highly recommend this series, and it is about that fight, that spiritual warfare fight um, between um, good and evil and things that we cannot see. The cosmic powers over this present darkness. So just wanted to uh, share with you that verse because it came up this week on my daily Bible verse um, app. And I remembered then it was referencing, it was lending its inspiration to this particular series. All right, so that takes us through the books that I have read since the last time I talked to you, some other recommendations that I wanted to add to you, um, and some review on things that I thought I had covered that maybe I didn't because they weren't in my notes. Um, and that takes us to the book haul. And again, it's summer, I've been traveling, I stop in every thrift store, bookstore along the way, and I'm gonna share some of those with you. So here they are. So these are not gonna be in any particular order um, I try and like add them to the top of the list whenever I'm doing, whenever I bring them home, but it doesn't always necessarily work out that way. This one I got, um, oh, and I've been looking for this one too. This one I got a while back, um, and I got it because the church that we go to, which is called Crossroads, we go to Eastside. Um, during Teacher Appreciation Week, you could uh, fill out like, I think it was like an online like Google form or something, just telling them that you were a teacher, where you taught, that sort of thing. Um, and they would send you encouragement, I think is how it was, um, pitched. <laughs> and what we ended up getting is a $25 gift card, um, to use on Amazon. And so my husband and I are both teachers and, um, I filled it out for both of us and I bought this for my classroom. It is the literary life commonplace book the, from the literary life podcast. Um, it's one of those things that was in my um, Amazon cart for a long time because I talked to my kids about making a commonplace book. Um, a commonplace book is basically just like a life notebook, something that you keep close at hand that you can quote or you can jot down like quotes or something that you read that stands out to you or make a list of something that you want to remember or um, things that you want to do. And we do a lot of that kind of creative writing in class. Um, and so I just, I thought this might be an interesting thing to have around for them to flip through to get ideas. So I purchased this with my $25 as well as a packet of pens. And um, I don't know if I brought them over here or not. I think I did, but like metaphor dice that had been referenced in a um, training that I went to not too long ago. So thank you Crossroads, um, especially Crossroads East for giving us those um, gift cards. I made good use of my $25 and used it on my classroom. But um, this, it has a lot of room for you to like work in it, but I still think this is really gonna work for us. They have um, some lists that I thought I might be able to show to the kids on, I can't think of what that thing's called, but like when you, you know, it gives me a little camera and it projects it for me. Um, but I thought this might help us along as we're having those conversations and just to leave it in the room so that they can uh, use it for inspiration. So that's the Literary Life Commonplace book. It's by the Literary Life Podcast. Uh, then I picked up this, Every Word You Cannot Say. Um, it is by Ian S. Thomas, and I can't remember if I ordered it on Amazon. I know that I ordered it because one of my kids said it was one of their favorite books of poetry, um, which is not my best wheelhouse there. So I'm always looking for ones that they connect with that I think I might wanna add to the classroom. So I have this one to read. That's on my to be read list. The Vogue August issue came in, which means the Vogue September issue should almost be here. Come on. Um, I think I've talked to you about the September issue before. There's a documentary. I always seek it out. Actually, last year I complained that it was hard for me to find a copy of it in the store because I was not a Vogue subscriber and one of my former students gifted me a subscription. So thank you, Lindsay, for that. Um, so I've been enjoying Vogue all year long, but this came in the mail. So that's on my to be read list. 
Um, my mom, like I think I told you earlier, I've been working with her on my parents on their estate. Um, and we are not a family that comes from like tons of money or anything. Um, so we're just trying to organize their affairs so that their last wishes are honored. Um, and then seeing like, where do you want certain things to go? We don't have anything of like massive value. Um, but there are things that I know are very sentimental as much as I am sentimental. So is my, so are my parents, both of them. So my mom gave me a couple of books. Um, and so I did want to share those with you because I'm going to say that comes in the book haul. Uh, one of them is a Bible. It's an old Bible. I was looking to see what the translation is. It says translated out of the original tongue. So I don't know what I'm going to call that version. But super old family Bible, not one that I will be taking off the shelf and reading, but, but I like that in the very back of it, some of my family has written, um, over here, has written like um, Doshi, Heaton, <coughs> and like birth, death dates, marriage dates, that sort of thing is on there. But it is well loved and falling apart, um, but I will put that in my bookshelf upstairs. She also had this in the stack of books to give me. It says roundabout the Alice and Jerry books. So, you know, the Dick and Jane books, that's what this looks like. Um, so interesting. Uh, so I will put that on the shelf as well. And I don't think this one had any other writing in it. Like I don't know who this belonged to, but my guess is it was like a school book for someone in the family. So happy to add that one to my shelf. And then the last one is this one. And it is just an encyclopedia. Oh, what was that last roundabout? Let me see if I can see a copyright 1930. Oops, sorry. 1941 is the latest one in that one. And then for the American Encyclopedia here, it's 1950. So just going to add those to my shelf too. Here's that book I was looking for. I picked it up. Um, looks like at the Tome Bookstore, which I think I talked to you the last time in my video that I visited that bookstore. And I picked this up for my, for my son's girlfriend's classroom. She teaches three through five, but she is an intervention specialist. So those reading levels may be a lot lower than that. So I picked that up for her classroom. So uh, sending that her way. I forgot when I was talking to you about um, my shelf of like currently reading, I meant to add this one on there too. It's the Illustrated Book of Days. And again, I can't imagine that I haven't talked to you about this. Um, it actually starts chronologically in March. Um, and then, you know, it's one of those that I keep on the shelf, pull down and just read whatever currently month, the month is. And I've been doing that for a couple of years, so I need to focus and get those done. But I don't know why I didn't talk to you about it before. But it's the book of days because it goes day by day. So let's see what today says. July 23rd, uh, King Ludwig the first of Bavaria so loved to look at pretty faces that he complained bitterly of the fashion of wearing veils that prevailed at the time. This was well known by the women of the region who would quickly raise their veils when they saw him coming. A cowslip pudding. And there's a recipe. Take two quarts of cowslip pips. I don't even know what that is. Pound them small with a half a pound of Naples biscuit grated. Three pints of cream. Boil these together. Beat them up. Ten eggs with a little cream and rose water. Sweeten your taste. Mix the whole well. Butter a dish. Pour the ingredients in with a little fine sugar overall and bake it. So just, I don't know. I love these kinds of daily, daily books. I don't know what they're called, but day books. I enjoy those and I'm pretty sure I've talked to you about it, but it wasn't in my list. So adding that one. The next book I picked up, um, again, taking my parents to a lot of appointments this summer. So down on Beachmont Avenue here in Cincinnati, I went to the book rack, which um, I've gone to a book rack before. There's a great one in Murray, Kentucky, where my son lives that I like to go to. So I thought I would try this out. It was fabulous. Um, independent bookstore, the book rack on Beachmont Avenue, well worth a visit. Um, I was looking in particular for Agatha Christie's um, Partners in Crime. They didn't have that. I'm not even sure they had any Agatha Christie's. Um, and I think that's why I ended up just picking this one up and buying it. But it's Ellery Adams, Murder in the Locked Library. I am now on chapter two. Um, it was $4 for the paperback. It's um, $8 uh, normally retail. So I feel like that's pretty good. Um, and I wanted to support the business even though they didn't have the specific book that I was looking for. Um, so highly recommend it. This is a book retreat mystery, Murder in the Lock Library, permanently checked out by Ellery Adams, who I've not read before. So currently reading that one. 
The next stack of books came from the book rack in Murray, Kentucky. I went down to see my son and his girlfriend and I always try and make it to that bookstore when I'm down there because she does have a lot of Agatha Christie's um, as well as I usually pick up a book of the month from there too. This one is The Far Field by Madhuri Vijay. That's what we're gonna say. Um, so adding that and this one, um, I wanna say it was about $5. I don't know why I don't have it marked here, but it says it was the book of the month choice in December of 2018. So adding that to my uh, to be read list. And then these. So after I picked them up, brought them home, I did look to see where they fall in our reading. So I'm gonna move those post-it notes each time I'm telling you about them. This is They Came to Baghdad. Um, it comes after, no, I'm not even gonna do that. This one is They Came to Baghdad. This one is Endless Night. And this is one of those nice new copies that are coming from the official authorized edition of the Agatha Christie like estate. Um, so that one's nice. This one is Crooked House. This one is The Clocks. I am super interested in the Agatha Christie covers and I've started like looking a little bit more into those. Sometimes it'll tell you who created the cover. If not, then whenever we go to read them, it's always covered on the um, Wikipedia site, which is nice. This one is black coffee, looking forward to that one. And that one is a hardback. And I think these came from Book Rack. I didn't keep terribly good notes on that. They may, some of these may have been from, some of these may have been from the various Goodwills or thrift stores that I've um, visited this summer. This one says the Harlequin tea set. And I think it's probably a short story collection. It says, and other stories. So, um, I don't know, it might be a newer collection. That'll be interesting to see where it says that it falls after sleep, 1997. So yeah, probably like a collection of er earlier um, um, published stories. A lot of her short stories were published in serials or magazines way before they were ever collected into a book. I'm pretty sure I've talked to you about Agatha Christie in every video, but um, uh, if not specifically, I know I covered it in the first student video that I did, the um, second adult video that I did, and then 11, 13, 14, 15, 18, 20, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Um, definitely been covering them all of this year as we started reading them. But even before that, I've always covered Agatha Christie for you because I've always appreciated her works and uh, highly recommend them. Two more Agatha Christie's that I'm pretty sure, these I know came from Book Rack because they have the sticker on them. So maybe these came from Thrifted. Pretty sure the book of the month though came from Murray, but maybe not. But this one, um, the only thing that I feel like I should say is the first time I went to the Book Rack in Murray, I felt like the prices were you know, fairly reasonable, especially on the Agatha Christie's. Even though she is the best-selling author um, behind the Bible and Shakespeare of all time, um, her works are super hard to find. So I very rarely run across them in thrift stores. Now I might run across them in a secondhand bookstore, um, which is usually a little pricier than a thrift store still, but this one was $7. Um, and you know, it's one of those that the cover says 45 cents, but yes, it's vintage. So there's that too. I do take that into consideration, but because I'm trying to buy all of them, um, and there's, you know, 66 novels plus short stories plus plays and everything. I don't want to pay a lot for each one of those. Um, so $7 was a little more than I wanted to pay for a little paperback. Um, but that's okay. It's a great cover. This one is A Pocket Full of Rye, A Jane Marple Murder Mystery. Um, and then I picked up this one, uh, Death Comes at the End. Again, great cover. This one was also $7. This one was $5. This is an Agatha Christie, but it's Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight. Um, and I wanted An African Childhood by Alexandra Fuller. And I wanted to pick up a copy of this because I want to recommend it to my book club for this year. And um, I am hosting book club at my house in a week and a half-ish. Um, and it's also our annual planning meeting. So I'll try and hit a video before then and then after. Um, but I really, I read this last year at my cousin's or maybe earlier this year, I can't remember, um, at my cousin's. I borrowed it when I was at her house and I really, really enjoyed it. So I am recommending that to my book club and it was $5. So again, $5 for a hardback, 
that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I picked up this one. It is a four in one volume Agatha Christie postmark murder. Um, and this one was $4. So that's what I mean. Like I'm just, I'm not really sure how you get $7 for these and $4 for this. It might be availability because I didn't have these, um, um, titles. So maybe it's because they're harder to find. So, you know, no judgment. I'm just saying wanting to own all of them at 66 plus. I don't want to be over $5 when I'm trying to buy one of them, but picked that one up. I picked up this book of the month. This was also $5 um, hardback, the proposal. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm try not trying to be critical here, but how are we paying $7 for this and $5 for this? Seven, five, and this is, you know, I, I have had a little bit of trouble on these little vintage copies that have, um, that I've been collecting over the years. When I read them, they fall apart. So you get one reading out of those. But um, there's that. So the proposal, it's by Jasmine Glory. So adding that to our book of the month, books up there. All right, so I'm not super organized on these book hauls either, but um, when I went down to visit my uh, son and his girlfriend, we drove to Clarksville, Clintonville, Clarksville, Tennessee. It was right across the border from where he lives in Western Kentucky. Um, and they had an independent bookstore called Hadoobum, <laughs> Hadoobum Book Traders. Um, it's right there in Clarksville. And Clarksville, Tennessee is actually the home of a university called, I can't remember, <laughs> but um, it's just a nice little small town. Um, and I bought this copy. This is one of my favorite books of all time, The Disreputable History of Frankie Landau Banks. You can see it has won numerous awards. I'm gonna put our little chair up here for this one because it's a good one. Um, it won the Prince Honor Award and the National Book Award finalist. It's by E. Lockhart. I've read several of her books, so I wanted to pick up a copy for that. So I will add a review if I don't already have one for that one. But I wanted a copy of that book for a long time. I seem to have mentioned E. Lockhart to you um, on numerous occasions. She is the one who wrote We Were Liars, which I book talked to you. Um, I didn't mark the episode that I talked to you about it, um, and it does need a good read, so I'll, I'll add those for you. I also read Fly on the Wall by her, and I'll add that review for you too. And then these I picked up there, um, and I want to say that they most of these were in this little bin. Pretty sure most of these are in this little bin for like 50 cents. So Stuart Woods Choke. Now, I don't know if I've talked to you about Stuart Woods, but I need to if not. MC Benton, I know I've talked to you about her, um, and that is There Goes the Bride and Dead Canaries Don't Sing, which is another cozy mystery, and that is by Cynthia Baxter, which I feel like maybe I've talked to you about her too. Oh, I did. Cynthia Baxter, I talked to you about her book, um, Lead, a Hearst, Lead a Horse to Murder. Cynthia Baxter, I'm not sure if I've talked to you about her book, but I have read it and it's up there, so I probably need to add a review if not. But the one that I read by her already is called Lead a Horse to Murder, and I remember really enjoying that. So adding this one, which is Dead Canaries Don't Sing. It's part of a Raining Cats and Dogs mystery series. The um, MC Benton, this is an Agatha Raisin, if I didn't already say that. And then most of Stuart Woods are not series. He just writes the same kinds of books, but I've read several by him too. I did talk to you about Stuart Woods in episode 26 but it's probably not like super complete of all the books by him that I've read. So I'll, I'll go back and revisit him. And here's that blue bistro. I told you I picked it up. It looks like I picked it up at the book rack of Murray for four fifty. So adding that to the um, Ellen Hildebrand group. So I picked up two Donna Andrews books. I listened to this. I want to say maybe in December, I listened to one of her books that are in this series, a Meg Lanslow um, mystery series. And I really, really enjoyed it. It took me a couple of tries of starting it to catch on like to the narrator. And then after I started, I'm like, I really, really like this series. So I've just been picking them up when I see them because now I know what they are. So I picked both of these books up. I don't know where, but um, I'm adding them to my to be read list. I don't think I read the um, titles to you. Six Geese a Slain and Some Like It Hawk really enjoy that series. This one says a Meg Lanslow Christmas mystery. So definitely going to be holding on to that one for Christmas because you know, I love seasonal reading. 
I don't know where these came from, but I picked up a copy of A Great and Terrible Beauty. This is a fabulous one by Libba Bray. Um, I will review it and before I add it to the shelf and talk to you about it. I'm pretty sure I've already talked about American Dirt. Um, I have a copy of this. I'm, I have a copy of this on my shelves, um, but I'm gonna add one to the classroom. It's a really good one. Um, I know I read the first chapter out loud to my seniors. It's a little more mature, but it was a really good like hook. Um, great first chapter. Again, you are the judge of what happens in your own classroom or with your own children, so no judgment, but it was a great read aloud for my group of seniors. I also picked up this book. It's Christina Dodd, Wrong Alibi in the Alaskan Wilderness, The Hunted Can Become the Hunter. Sounded good. I don't know this author at all. We've talked about like, how do I decide which books I pick up when I'm thrifting? I pick up copies of the ones that I've read that I wanna make sure I have a copy of and I can put on my classroom shelves or pass to someone that I think needs to read it. Um, I pick up, I've already read this one, I pick up copies of the series that I'm already reading or authors that I've already read before. Um, but this one, just strictly falling for the cover. I like the cover, it sounds intriguing, I will pick it up. I picked up a copy of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. I've read parts of this, I haven't read the whole thing though, but again, it would be a good one for the classroom. I have two other, um, I, I have lots more, I think, but I have two other Agatha Christie's that I just came across here, and I'm not sure where I picked these up. I think maybe, I have a friend who's in our Agatha group and she brought a bag of books where she has multiple copies of things, and I think maybe she's the one who gave me this, I'm pretty sure, but it's Queen of Crime, Duchess of Death, Agatha Christie, and it's by Jeffrey Feynman, so I'm adding that to my Agatha stack of books um, to read and reference to her. Pretty sure this is also the one that I'm like, this is a really cool setup. I also love when you get a vintage book and somebody has like their address stamp in there. And I'm always like, Dorothy Brannon, thank you for sharing. Uh, but this looks like it's gonna give you quite a bit of information about Agatha, like background information. So I'm interested in that. And then I have The Life and Times of Miss Jane Marple by Ann Hart. Um, again, I'm pretty sure that came in the bag that my friend shared with me. And it looks like it's just talking about the character of Miss Marple, so that should be interesting. Um, I don't know that I've shared this with you. A friend of mine gave me this for my birthday or for Christmas. I think for my, I think she gave it to me for Christmas, and then um, I took it when we went on a girls' trip. Made everybody play the game with me. It's Agatha Christie's Death on the Cards, um, a card game for two to six sleuthing friends, family members inspired by the works of Agatha Christie. And it is super fun, um, but you better be an Agatha Christie lover because. Those are the only people that would agree to play with me. <laughs> like, you have to have a little bit of background knowledge about Agatha Christie. Um, not a ton, but you got to have a little bit of background knowledge about Agatha Christie and, and just enjoy her stuff in order to do that one. It looks like I made a note and said that the, um, the Andrews, Some Like It Hawk, I picked up at the Goodwill in Loveland. So it looks like I apparently also picked up this Sheila Conley book, Murder at the Mansion, a Victorian Village Mystery. I don't know this author, I don't know this series, uh, but again, brought in by the cover and the fact that it definitely is a cozy mystery um, because of the way that it sounds. So yeah, drawn in, I'm gonna pick it up, especially whenever, like at the Loveland Goodwill, I wanna say like pa paperbacks are a dollar, like I can't pass that up. So I went to Columbus with my uh, family, my mom, dad, and sister. And um, again, I was looking for partners of crime um, uh, for our next, the next reading. I did not find a copy of that, still haven't found a copy of it, so I just listened to it online. But I did find this, this is Agatha Christie. It's A Mysterious Life by Laura Thompson. This is often referenced in the All About Agatha podcast that I listen religiously to um, and reference. So I was super happy to pick this up. Now this one was $14.99. It's a little bit out of my range. Usually try and keep books $10 and under, but um, I know that it, because I had been listening to the podcast and I made a list of books that I was looking for, I was willing to pay a little bit more for that. And it's half price book. So it um, on the inside, it's $35 retail. So, you know, accurately half price, right? So adding that to the list. And um, then I picked up a couple of others. I visited a couple of um, little libraries since the last time I've talked to you too, and there is one in my hometown here, Fayetteville, where we live, um, but it's up by the police station, and this was there, so I always have a little tote bag in my trunk of books that I can exchange at little libraries, so I put a couple in, and I got this out. It's Lisa Scott O'Lines Exposed. I thought that looked really good. 
um, as well as a stack of magazines that I don't know if I have here to show you, but um, I love magazines. I love magazines. Uh, they are disposable, but I still, I love to just flip through um, when I'm poolside or at the beach or in the car or on the back porch um, or just on the couch at night. I love a, a good magazine. So I picked up a whole stack of magazines in that free little library at Fayetteville, just so you know if you're close. Uh, another friend of mine gave me this book. Um, it's American Government. I won't be reading this one, but um, she was like, I know that sometimes you do like crafts and stuff with old books, so I thought you might want this one. And um, it's just such a beautiful old book. I probably won't be able to craft with it. Like, look at these state seals that are in the back. How cool is that? Um, but uh, maybe I'll decorate with it a little bit, so maybe it won't go on my shelf like in the to be read or the red list, but maybe I'll decorate with it, like stacking things up. But um, you can tell it was like a textbook because it has the Board of Education stamp in there. But um, I just, I thought it was really cool. So adding that one to my book um, haul. So see, I don't buy all my books. Some are gifted to me. Um, the next one that I wanted to show to you, a friend of mine gave this one to me too. It's called Ohio Wine Country Excursions by Patricia Latimer. And it's the all the wineries in Ohio, which I thought was really cool. I don't really visit a lot of wineries. Like I've probably, you know, gone to four or five here in Ohio. And then when we're on vacation, we might stop. Um, if we're on a girl's trip, we usually stop by one, but I thought this was kind of interesting and I appreciate that one. This month I was really on the lookout for trying to find that book that I knew was coming up, Partners in Crime by Agatha Christie. So I did stop in a lot more stores than usual. Um, and unfortunately I just was not able to find it. Now, I know I can go online and get the book. I know that. I'm not a good online shopper, um, but <clears throat> I just, I, you know, I really want to thrift it. More than anything, I want to thrift it. But even, you know, going to the Book Rack in Murray, I ended up paying $7 for some of those paperbacks. So probably should just go online and look. Um, but <clears throat> because I visited so many uh, stores, I ended up with a big book haul. Um, and here are some that I picked up from the Half Price Books in Mason. When I took my parents for um, an appointment over there, I'm like, hey, let me run in to see if I can find that book. And then I come out with a whole stack of books that do not include Partners in Crime. Um, but <clears throat> I got this. This is a good copy. Um, it's called uh, Beautiful Word Bible. It's a NIV version. We have a couple of copies of Bibles in the classroom. Again, I'm not mixing religion and what's it called? Uh, church and state. I'm not mixing church and state. We have a plethora of different kinds of literature in the classroom, but um, because we do often read literature that alludes to the Bible uh, or references the Bible or a Bible story, and the Bible is great literature, um, and aside to whether or not you're treating that as sacred literature or not, um, I do have a couple of copies of the Bible, and some were donated, and they're just not great copies, so I was happy that that was, did I pay seven dollars for it? Yeah, $7. I thought that was a pretty good deal for such an updated um, Bible that was really cool looking. Um, I'm adding this one. It was only $2. It's of Poseidon. I've already read it, so I will need to um, <clears throat> put that in the stack over here with books that I need to review and, and book talk for you. But that's a really good one. I was glad to pick that up for $2. I know I've talked to you about Marcus Zusak, and I really like him, and I have read I Am the Messenger. It's another one that I really like, so I will book talk that one for you. And then I did pick up some Agatha Christie's, just not the one that I needed at the time. Uh, the Mousetrap and Other Plays. Looks like I paid $5 for that one. Remember Death, $3. The Patriotic Murders, $3. And Funerals Are Fatal, $5. So I did find some good Agathas there. Looks like that trip to Half Price Books ended up costing me $28.87. That's not too shabby. Um, my most expensive book being that Bible that I'm putting in the classroom. But that's not a bad deal. I'm pretty happy with that. It's a good trip. The only thing is I was looking for a particular title. And then the public library in the town where I teach, which is Blanchester, um, their public library had a book sale, which we have not done since the pandemic, so they had a lot to sell. Um, so I went in there and I picked up some books for my shelf, but more than that, they were mostly books for my classroom. So I'll show you some of those. I'm adding a copy of Richard Peck's A Long Way From Chicago to my um, awards winner shelf. Um, he was a national book finalist, and this is actually a Newbery um, honor book. 
but if I'm not mistaken, he also won a Newberry for something else. So I'm pretty sure it's going on the award shelf. There are two books in this series, A Long Way From Chicago and A Year Down Yonder. And I mean, I remember that A Year Down Yonder was, is still one of my favorite um, YA books. I really, really enjoyed it. So I will book talk that for you. I picked up a copy of this from that library um, book sale. Um, it's Ian Rankin's The Beat Goes On. It's the complete Rebus short stories. Um, I don't know if I've talked to you about that before, but I started to get kind of interested in all these shows that I watch and then finding out that they actually come from well-known bookstore book series. Um, and Rebus is one of those that is a kind of an older show um, that I watch on Redbox or Acorn. I don't remember which one, but enough that I've continued watching and I really like it. And then I realized it's from a well-known series by Ian Rankin. So I picked that up for my house. Um, Son of the Mob Hollywood Hustle by Gordon Corman. Picked that up for the classroom um, because I recommend this book all the time in the classroom and I didn't have a copy of it. Um, I picked up a copy of Etiquette and Espionage by Gail Carringer for the classroom. I've not read this particular series, but she has another series that I really, really love. Can't think of it right off the bat, but um, I'll uh, book talk that one for you. Um, here in the future, something to look forward to. Um, I picked up a copy of a book for my son's girlfriend, Hunter. I needed to stop saying my son's girlfriend and just call her Hunter. Um, but I picked this up for her classroom as Beverly Cleary's Ralph S. Mouse that I thought her kids might enjoy. I picked up a copy of The Vampire Diaries for our classroom. And Hilary Duff's Elixir. I have not read this, but I think it looks intriguing. So putting that in the classroom. I picked up a copy of J.K. Rowling's The Crimes of Grindelwald. It's a screenplay, and I'm putting that on my shelf because I haven't read it. It's going on my to-be-read list. Um, the Girl on the Train uh, is a super good thriller. So I can't remember if I have a copy of that or not. If I have a copy of this, this is not one that I would put in the classroom, but it might be one that I would either give to someone or um, put in a lending library. Speaking of that, big, big news, big news. I forgot. A friend of mine called um, late last week and she said, hey, I've got a preposition for you. I've got a proposition for you with some prepositions, but I've got a proposition for you. My sister uh, owned a book company and it shut down and she had a little library outside of it and she wanted to find a good home for it. So my neighbor took it and now my neighbor um, is deciding that she doesn't want it anymore because we live on a street that's not, um, you know, it doesn't have a lot of traffic. So would you like it? Absolutely. So they dropped it off to me this past weekend. I haven't had time to install it yet, but a little library is coming. So I'm sure that will be um, another video on its own, but super excited about that. I don't have a lot of foot traffic out here either, but um, just, you know, I've been making this video for the last looks like four hours and 40 minutes. Um, and there has been quite a bit of traffic because I can see like out my window to the street. Um, and we live in a resort neighborhood. Um, you know, it's on a lake, so there are people that are full-timers, part-timers, whatever in here. Um, and there are enough people, especially on the weekends, that are walking, walking their dog, riding, jogging, that sort of thing, that I think it would create enough that maybe it would get enough attention. We'll see. We'll see. It's a new endeavor. I'm excited. Anywho, I thought this one would be a fun one for the classroom. It's called At First Sight by Christina, sorry, Catherine Hapka. Um, went to a coffee shop and they had a little lending library there where they were. So again, took a book, traded a book in, picked a book up. This is Group, How One Therapist and a Circle of Strangers Saved My Life. It's from Reese's Book Club. Dun, dun, dun. Haven't mentioned one of hers in a while. It's Christy Tate. Um, so haven't read that yet, but it's going on the to be read list. If I'm not mistaken though, I was talking to my sister was with me and she either started reading it or started listening to it and said she wasn't a fan. So oh, we'll see. What coffee shop was that? Uh, Rose, R-O-H-S Street Cafe, I think. I'll link it, but I'm pretty sure that was the name of it. It's down by University of Cincinnati's campus. And, um, you know, if I were driving by and I saw that it was a coffee shop and I was looking for a coffee shop, I would be like, I don't know. I mean, the garbage cans were lined up outside down front and it was in like what looked like a house, you know, like UC campus house. So I was like, I don't know. But we drove there. Uh, specifically for the purpose of adding that coffee shop to my coffee shop stop list. Um, and when you walked in, it was amazing. <laughs> like lots of space, super cool, very friendly staff, really good coffee. 
Um, we had coffee and a muffin or a sandwich or something, and then we took it to the front porch um, because we had our dogs with us. And um, actually sitting on that front porch was delightful. It just, when you first look at it, it doesn't look like much, but super enjoyed it and highly recommend. R-O-H-S, I think is what it's called. Coffee shop um, down by University of Cincinnati. So there's your little helpful hint for today. Uh, keep a little tote book with you in the car or when you're traveling or whatever for those little libraries or little lending libraries um, so that you can leave a book, take a book, and end up with a book that you want on your shelf and then exchange one that you've already read or that you would recommend you know, to someone else. So I'm always happy to do that. Um, another one that I actually paid retail for, oops, here it is, is this. It's I Will Teach You To Be Rich. Um, I listened to the podcast, uh, Beautiful Mess, which I highly, highly recommend. It's Elsie Larson. We share the first name. My first actual name is Elsie, Elsie DeShannon. Um, I don't go by Elsie, but she does. Uh, but I listened to her podcast. It has to do more with, um, I don't know, design, lifestyle, that sort of thing. Um, but they are doing a book section on their podcast, and they recommend this guy, and they brought him in um, to talk. And it was enough that I thought, I need that book. Like, I need to read that book. It's called I Will Teach You To Be Rich. It's by Remit Sethi. That's how I'm going to say it. I can't remember how it was whenever he talked. But it says, no guilt, no excuses, no BS. Just a six-week program that works. So super excited to read that one. I don't know where this one came from, so I'm just going to add it in here because I don't see it in my notes, but I'll have to add it. It's The Life and Crimes of Agatha Christie by Charles Osborne. I feel like when we went to Columbus... I picked up some books um, from, what was it called? Karen Wycliffe's books. And I don't know why I don't have that on here unless maybe I talked to you about them last time. I don't think I did though. But um, this is one that I picked up from her um, and it looks like I paid $10 for it. And it says mystery, biography, British literature. She's made all these really cool comments in here. If you are in Columbus and you can make it by her store, Let's just say it's an experience, not air conditioned, <laughs> um, more crowded than my library is, stacks and stacks of books. But I went in, I looked, I couldn't find what I was looking for. She was helping other customers. Um, when I was able to talk to her, I asked her and she was like down the hall, second room, back in the back, straight. It's, you know, here's where these are, here's where these, she knows where the books are. So, um, you know, if you're going with a list of particular titles, then she can help you out. If not, you could get lost in there for a day if it's not a very hot day, because if it's air conditioned, it didn't feel like it. Um, but you know, in her defense, it was a super hot day. Um, but I'm excited to read this one. And then this is another one that like, when I started looking through it, I'm like, what a treasure of a reference book for my Agatha Christie book. So super excited to read that one. Okay, I think that's the book haul portion. Um, you know that my book hauls will get a lot shorter <laughs> when I go back to work full time, which is in less than a month. Oh, um, for someone who loves their job, and I really do love my job. Um, it comes with its own set of stress, but um, God, this summer has just been so nice to relax, to rearrange my bookshelves, to spend all day on the porch reading and writing. Um, and just relaxing and traveling, um, uh, you know, perusing bookstores and thrift stores and just visiting friends. It has been such a blessing of a summer that was much, much needed. Teaching is really, really hard. <laughs> and as much as it is rewarding, it is exhausting and takes over your life for the nine months that you are just trying to make it to the next day. So I really appreciate my summers. Um, I've done a lot of book haul this summer, uh, enough that I had to rearrange the library, get rid of some things um, and try and reorganize it. And I just keep adding more, which I'm sure I will always do, but the summer is winding down. So my book hauls will wind down too. Ooh, okay, I'm saying that. And then there's still a couple over here that I needed to talk to you about. Um, when I was visiting Hunter, my um, son and Hunter, she had this book on her nightstand. She said she had already read it. And so I'm like, no, I think actually she said, do you want to borrow it? Which is always nice because, you know, if you're a book lover, <laughs> sometimes when people borrow your books, they keep them for a very long time. Sometimes when you're a book lover, you borrow books and you keep them for a very long time. 
I'm sorry, I apologize. I need to get through all those borrowed books, but I can't help it. I like see something like that and I'm like, oh, I've been wanting to read that. And she said, do you wanna borrow it? Cause I'm already finished with it. So I borrowed it, I'm reading it. I should be farther along than this, but it's been a little busy with other things um, that I'm just not sitting down and reading as much as I want to. I'm listening to audios while I'm cleaning the house, but it's People We Need on Vacation by Emily Henry. I'm absolutely loving it. Um, and I will return it to her whenever I finish it. <laughs> And then I have these three, I'm probably on my list and I just haven't talked to you about them, but um, Remember Death by Agatha Christie. I don't know where it came from. Oh, these came from that Karen Wycliffe because I can see her handwriting in here. 275, 275 for Towards Zero. So I picked up a bunch of Agathas from her. Sleeping Murder, I don't see a price on that, but but look at that cover. I mean, that is a great Agatha Christie cover, that. And then um, I got a book, uh, I got a gift card from Barnes and Noble for my birthday. And I don't know if you're like me, you know, I have 4,000 books that I want to buy. But if you give me a gift card, like I have to let it marinate for a while. Like I'm not sure what I want to spend it on. And I think it was $50. Like I feel like it was a lot. So I turned 50. So a lot of people, when they gave me a gift this year, it was 50 of something, right? Um, but it took me a while, but I went, I think it's when we were in Columbus again, I was with my sister, my mom and my dad, and I had my little list with me. I ended up buying nothing that was on the list, um, but just walking around Barnes and Noble and buying some other things. And I ended up with this. It's Bibliophile, an illustrated miscellany by Jane Mount. I don't know if you have seen her work before, but she illustrates book covers and people's bookshelves that look like this. You can send in a list of your favorite books and she will draw them for you. Um, but there's a great online presence and this is basically just an ode to book lovers. Like it has bookstores, um, book lists, a uh, list of historical fiction, um, short stories. It just is a treasure trove and I look forward to just loving this book. <laughs> All right, that being said, there are a couple of other things that of course I wanna cover for you. I heard that there is a new reality TV show coming out that has to do with books. Um, so what podcast? I was listening to a podcast that covered this. Um, I think it's Book Riot. Pretty sure that's the one. I'll look and see if I can find it. Um, but they said that author Kwame Alexander, who I'm pretty sure I've mentioned to you before, and Jason Reynolds, who I know I've mentioned to you before, A Long Way Down, that, that book, um, they are going to host this reality show. And, I, the, you know, neither one of them were particularly, like, selling the um, reality show because they're like, seriously, how is this going to work? And are we just jumping on the bandwagon? Probably. Um, but I thought it sounded interesting. I will check into it and see what I think um, if it's on a platform that I can watch. Uh, and then I think I've talked to you about this book that I picked up thrifted. I've heard about it a lot. It's called Tom Parada's Mrs. Fletcher. Obviously, I'm also drawn into the Mrs. Fletcher thinking that it might reference Murder, She Wrote. It does not. Um, but they are making this into a TV series on HBO. So I heard. I listened to a podcast, um, and again, I'll have to see if I can find it for you. Um, I think it's it's not what you think or it's not what you know, something like that. Um, the podcast was, but the whole thing was focused on the Go Ask Alice books that I'm not sure if I've talked to you about before. So again, I'll have to um, I'll have to review one of those if not. But I have a lot to say about those books as a librarian. It's one of those cult classic books that kids came in asking for every year that I'm like, seriously, there are so many more books in here that are better than that book. But it's a cult classic. They do want to read it. Um, but it was a great podcast talking about the history of that, um, not only that particular book, but all of the, um, they're supposed to be anonymously written by Beatrix Sparks um, that someone gave them to her and then she just edited them to be published, whatever. It's a whole conversation that I don't have time to do here, but it was a great podcast. So throwing that one out to you. I feel like I talked to you about this, but again, I didn't see it in my notes um, when I was cleaning up my notes and my shelves here lately, but um, the book is Lord of the Flies. I reviewed this back in 2021 in March, so I have to see if I actually talked to you about it. Um, but I love this book. It's one of the first novels that I taught when I started teaching back in 1996-ish, four, 
94. <laughs> Actually, 96, because that's when I came to Blanchester and I taught, I, they, somebody handed me this and said, this is the book you will be teaching. I was like, I don't know, but I did, and it was great. I love it. Students, maybe not always so much, but I always book talk this book, and this year when I book talked it and talked about like the concept of it, one of my students said, hey, Miss Levin, there's a TV show that sounds a lot like that. It's on Netflix. It's called The Society. It is based on the premise of this book. It is not this book, um, but I highly recommend it. It's called The Society. It's on Netflix. I love this little guy that I say this little guy. He's a high school freshman, but um, he was like, you know, you probably can't recommend it to the class. Like uh, it might not be class appropriate or anything, but I really think you would like it. I loved it. He's right. We couldn't watch it in class or anything, but he's right. It was exactly built on that premise of take a group of people, take all the adults out. What would teenagers do? the society on Netflix. So I know I've also talked to you about um, Michael Pollan's books before. This is Omnivore's Dilemma and uh, Food Rules by Michael Pollan. And I also have his book called Cooked. I can't put my hands on it right now for some reason, but um, it's on my to be read list. Um, but I did want to mention the fact that, you know, like I was looking at that bookshelf list that I have, like books that I've mentioned to you. And I'm like, a lot of these are movies or series and I haven't really seen all of them. So I was kind of going down through there and saying like, Hmm, I think maybe that one has a series. So I Googled Michael Paul in TV series and he does have one. Um, it is called, I don't know what it's called, but <laughs> I don't know what it's called, um, but I found it on Netflix. Uh, oh, I think it's called Cook. There you go, which is the name of the book that I need to be reading and I don't seem to have a copy of it right here for you right now. I know I have it, um, but I love his books. I've gone to talk, I've gone to hear him speak he is super educated on food, health, um, natural, organic. Um, I don't even like just what makes us eat things. <laughs> super good talk. And um, I watched a little bit of the series on, did I say Netflix? I think it is. Um, it didn't like hold my interest. It didn't make me want to like sit down and watch every minute of it, but I left it on while I was working in the kitchen. Um, our TV, you can like see it from the kitchen. So it's super easy when you're working to just turn around and have something on. Um, but, um, if I have not, it looks like I have talked to you in episode seven, eight, 20 and 21 about Michael Pollan. So I probably have already reviewed these books for you, but I wanted to let you know that there is that series on Netflix. Uh, I don't have a copy of the book Love and Gelato, but I did hear that it is also a series on Netflix this summer. So um, just so you know that that does come from a young adult novel that was very popular. I haven't read it. And then the Han series. So it's not Summer Without You, To All the Boys I've Loved Before, and Burn for Burn. These are all on my to be read list. I think I've talked to you about them before, but I did read Jenny Han's The Summer I Turned Pretty. Um, and that is now on Netflix as a series, I believe it is. My sister said it's super good. I haven't watched it yet, but it's on my to be watch list. And I'm pretty sure Jenny Han, like to all the boys I love before, has already been turned into a series on Netflix, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then Burn for Burn, she wrote with um, Siobhan Vivian, um, but I haven't read that. I haven't read these yet. Here's that Jay's journal and Go Ask Alice that I was talking to you about. I have already reviewed Go Ask Alice, but it was back in 2021, so I don't know if I've talked to you about it or not. So I may need to, like I said, add those um, to the list. When I told you that I picked up a copy of the Stuart Woods, I have a bunch of his. I have um, Stuart Woods and Par Parnell Hall, Smooth Operator, a Teddy Faye novel featuring Stone Barrington, which is one of his main characters. Here's Skin Game. I feel like Parnell Hall is a cozy mystery author. Looks like I have Dirt, which I really uh, want to read by him. One of his books that I've read that I love so much is called Dirty Work. This is really, really good. Um, so I will write a review on that one. Um, when I was in South Carolina, I borrowed this book. I know, stop borrowing books to Shannon, but when people offer, I'm like, yes, I'll take it. It's called The Water is Wide. It's by Pat Conroy, who has a history down there in Buford, South Carolina, where we were. I have read South Abroad already. I don't think I have a review out there for you, so I'll need to add one of those for you. Um, but I borrowed this, The Water is Wide, uh, from a friend of, two friends actually, they're um, married. But um, when I was at their house for book club when we were down in South Carolina, somehow we started talking about Pat Conroy and the fact that he has a lot of history there. 
And um, my friend Chris's husband said, have you read The Water is Wide? Because that's probably his best one. It has a lot of history from down here. Um, so I told him, no, I've read South Abroad with our book club, but not that one. So he was like, take this with you. You need to read it. So of course I comply. Okay, it looks like I have been filming for about five hours. So I'm going to try and cut that down for you to maybe under two, three if I can't. Um, and I need to do these more often. I'm well aware of that. I said I was going to do it in the summer and then I've gotten crazy. But I feel like my life is, I'm, you know, what does it take me till the end of July? But I feel like my life is kind of back together. Um, so maybe I'll be able to do these a little more often. I appreciate you hanging out there with me. I hope you've made it to the end. Um, I hope you add some of these books to your to be read list and that you found something that you can connect with. As always, I am honored to be your friendly librarian. Most, if not all of the books that I reviewed for you today or mentioned to you today, you can get for free at your public library in print. You can go online, get your library card. You can listen to eBooks. I mean, sorry, you can listen to audiobooks. You can get the eBooks. You can get these things for free. Or if you're like me and you are thrifting, you can um, hopefully, as we're talking more and more about all these books and authors and series, um, you will start to recognize them when you are thrifting and pick them up for a dollar or two dollars or sometimes more. Thanks for spending the day with me in my library. I am happy to share it with you. Let's be social. All of my links are down below as well as all of the books that I talk about, review, and mention for you are down below in the notes. Um, and I try and make sure that I have listed all of those for you. So if you go back and watch any of my videos, down in the notes, I've always put all of the books that I talk about. Hit the like and subscribe button so that I know that you're following along. I have gained a lot of followers in the last month and I just want you to know, I really appreciate it if you are still after what, however many hours this ends up being hanging out with me in the end. Leave me a comment, let me know um, what you're reading, what you want to read. If you are looking for something in particular, if there's a book that you particularly connected with, any kind of conversation that you want to have, book related, I am here for it. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.